Preface to Malaria and Greek History by William Henry Samuel Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Malaria and Greek History by W. H. S. Jones, M.A. Fellow of St. Catherine's College, Cambridge, Assistant Master at the Percy School. To which is added, The History of Greek Therapeutics and the Malaria Theory. By E. T. Withington, M.A. M.P. Balliol College, Oxford. 2. Major Ronald Ross, F.R.S. C.B. Professor of Tropical Medicine in the University of Liverpool. As a tribute to his labours for the welfare of mankind, I dedicate Quid quid hoc libelli quelle comque. Preface This book is an attempt to correct and develop the theory proposed tentatively in the little work Malaria. Put briefly, this theory is as follows. In the struggle for existence, man has competed not only with his fellow men, but also with the wild animals and disease parasites. The fight against beasts was decided long before the historic period, but parasites have always been and still are formidable opponents. Whole tribes have been wiped out by plague, Kala Azar, and measles. And even when the diseased parasite does not win such a decisive victory, it often weakens a nation so much that the latter falls an easy victim to its healthier neighbours. Accordingly, I have tried to show how malaria played a part in the decline of the ancient Greeks. Dr. E. T. Withington tells me that the malaria theory explains a great difficulty in the history of Greek medicine, and upon this point he has written a short essay which appears at the end of the volume. It may be that some readers will think that my theory cannot be true unless it be proved that malaria did not exist in early Greece. But the evil consequences of malaria are, to a certain extent, independent of the date of its introduction. Although they are most severe and most obvious when a district is attacked which hitherto has been free from infection. Moreover, it is at least doubtful whether Greece was malarious in early times, and even if it was, the number of cases may not have been very great. In this connection, I should like to quote a few sentences from a recent work by Major Ross. Suppose that the identophiles have been present from the first, but that the number of infected immigrants has been few. Then possibly some of these people have happened to take up their abode in places where the mosquitoes are rare. Others may have recovered quickly. Others may not have chance to possess parasites in suitable stages when they have been bitten. Thus the probability of their spreading the infection will be very small. Or supposing, even, that some few new infections have been caused, yet, by our rough calculations in section 12, unless the mosquitoes are sufficiently numerous in the locality, the little epidemic may die out after a while, for instance, during the cool season. And if the number of infected persons introduced from outside remains small, this state of things may continue for years or centuries. The disease will fail to make headway, and will die out. Now suppose that the number of infected immigrants is suddenly greatly increased, then much larger numbers of mosquitoes will become infected, and may, in their turn, infect more healthy people than the recovery weight will compensate for. Endemic cases will be in, will increase, at first slowly, then rapidly, until suddenly there will be a widespread epidemic. It is my opinion that in this way malaria fell like a blight upon many fertile districts of Greece, as it almost certainly fell upon Attica in the 5th century BC. With the increase of trade, foreigners must have entered the country with greater frequency and in greater numbers, and nothing could be more likely than the number of infected persons so increased that a severe epidemic was a natural consequence. In early times malaria, if it existed at all, seems to have been slight in amount, and so not severe enough to prevent the country from reaching a high state of development of prosperity. Many observers in all parts of the world have been kind enough to send me, unasked, much valuable criticism and information. These include Professor Edson of Denver, Professor Selly of Rome, Professors Sevas and Cousius of Athens, Dr. Cardamatis of Athens, Dr. Genovese of Corina, and Mr. Spencer Jerome of Capri. In particular, I wish to thank Dr. Otto Everts, who has sent me a long account of his work among the Indians of Mexico. He is convinced that the destruction of the Indian races of the West Indian Islands is due not to the cruelty of the Spaniards, 
but to the malignity of newly imported infectious diseases. For Europeans, he goes on to say, malaria is, even on the coast of Mexico, extremely mild. It practically does not exist. Yet from 50% to 90% of all Indians die from malaria, according to the official tables. On my last trip, I went through several Indian villages which were passing through an epidemic of malaria, and had already lost 10% of their inhabitants, mostly children. According to my thesis, all newly introduced infectious diseases are specially malignant, and all specially malignant infectious diseases are newly introduced. I deduce from these facts that malaria is for Indians a newly introduced disease. In my opinion, scientific societies ought to send out physicians all over the world with a commission to answer a ready-made interrogatory about the differences in malignity of diseases according to races and climates. This would throw much light upon history. I have to thank many friends for help and encouragement. Mr. A.W. Spratt, Mr. L. Elston, Mr. S. Gazali, Dr. E.T. Whittington have also helped in revising the proof sheets. The malaria literature is immense. Several thousand books and articles have already appeared. So far as I know, however, no work exists dealing with the influence of malaria upon history. I trust that the short bibliography at the end of this volume contains all the most important books bearing upon the question to which I have limited my inquiry. Modern Greek names are merely transliterated. The names of ancient towns are spelt in the way they are given in most modern histories. The Hippocratic Corpus is quoted with Kuhn's paging. But references are generally given to Lithra or Kulenwine as well. In every case, I have tried to give the most approved reading. The statistics given by the Greek Anti-Malarial League are often incorrect, though not to such an extent as seriously to diminish their value. Wherever possible, they have been corrected. W. H. Jess Jones, St. Catherine's College, Cambridge. Addenda. While this book was in the press, a new volume of Transactions, 1908, was published by the Greek Anti-Malarial League. It contains much fresh information, including an account of the malarious condition of Crete, page 506, full, and a detailed list of Greek marshes, page 544 to 553. From the statistics now published as planned, that my calculations on page 12 only give roughly to relative unhealthiness of the Greek towns. The mortality tables upon which I base my conclusions give the consensus of 1896. The new volume, page 556, states that in 1907 the populations of these towns were Athens, 174,430 Piraeus, 74,583 Patras, 37,724 Syra, 17,809 Trikala, 18,132 Corfu, 29,032 Follow, 23,563 Larissa, 18,014 Zant, 13,580 Kalamata, 15,397 Pyrkos, 13,690 Tripolitsa, 10,789 On page 150 is made the interesting statement that the inhabitants of the malarious districts of Tritia are lazy and sluggish. At a conference held at Liverpool University on January 25, 1909, it was asked by what route malaria entered ancient Greece. There were so many possible ways that I have refrained in this book from discussing the question. I would remark, however, that malaria might very well creep in quite unobserved. See North Roman Fever, page 66. End of Preface Section 1 of Malaria in Greek History by William Henry Samuel Jones and Edward Theodore Withington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Introduction Malaria is caused by a multitude of minute animal parasites which, developing at the expense of the red blood corpuscles of their human host, produce attacks of fever at definite intervals. These parasites are of four kinds. 1. The quartan, causing a fever which lasts about nine hours and recurs every third day. 
2. The mild tertian, causing a fever which lasts 11 hours and recurs every other day. 3. The malignant tertian. The fever may last for 40 hours. The temperature rises slowly, halts, declines a little, and then rises again to a still greater height. Finally it falls. The attack recurs every other day. 4. The quotidian, causing a fever which lasts from 6 to 12 hours and comes on every day. A quotidian fever, however, besides being the result of one generation of quotidian parasites, may be produced by either a. three parallel generations of quartan parasites, or b. two parallel generations of tertian parasites. There may be also mixed infections due to different parasites together, and double quartans. The malarial attack is divided into three stages. 1. The cold stage. 2. The hot stage. 3. The sweating stage. 1. The attack begins with a feeling of nausea and weariness. The head begins to ache and the patient shivers. There is a reduction of the skin temperature accompanied by internal fever. The pulse is quick, small and hard. 2. The skin becomes hot and red. The pulse full and bounding. Thirst is intense. Delirium is sometimes present. 3. In this stage there is more or less sweating, followed by cessation of fever and even by sleep. This is the normal course of a malarial attack, but there are numberless variations. The most common is the hot stage alone, the first and last stages being scarcely noticeable. Very often the fever does not intermit at all, but merely declines more or less on certain days or at certain hours. The result is remittent malaria, not seldom, especially in mixed or double infections. The fever is practically continuous. Some of the irregular forms of malaria are very hard to distinguish from typhoid. Microscopic examination is the only reliable means of diagnosis. If not treated with quinine, which has great power to kill the parasites, the disease will cause frequent relapses of fever, anemia and enlargement of the spleen. In some cases, the parasites may remain in the body for years and fever result whenever exceptional strain, over fatigue or chill, has to be undergone. The malaria parasite is carried from man to man by anopheline mosquitoes. It is therefore clear that a knowledge of the life and habits of this group is of great importance. Especially is this the case in estimating the prevalence of malaria at a time when statistical records were impossible. The mosquito lives in water during the stages of egg, larvae, and nympha. As a perfect insect, its life is passed in the air. The eggs are deposited by preference in stagnant or almost stagnant waters, shallow pools, the margins of streams, in fact any surface water that is not disturbed by currents or otherwise, may serve as a breeding ground. The movement of water is hostile to the life of larvae. These facts explain why malaria is most common in marshy districts and why it disappears when the land is properly drained. Cultivation of the soil, if it diminishes the number of surface puddles, tends to lessen the amount of the disease. If, on the other hand, it requires a partial flooding of the soil, as is the case with rice, the disease will increase as more and more land is brought under cultivation. Weaned mosquitoes during the daytime live in woods, cellars, caves, and other dark, damp places. In the evening they leave these haunts and feed on the blood of man and other animals. Hence it is dangerous to remain in the open after sunset, because the anophylines are thus given a better opportunity of biting. Woods near marshy land are dangerous, because they shelter mosquitoes during the day. Woods on hills are a great advantage, because when thus situated they help to prevent mountain torrents from flooding the valleys below. The malaria mosquito cannot fly very far in any direction. Hence the disease is, in a special sense, a local one, and attaches itself to particular districts. That malaria and marshes are intimately connected was noticed by Hippocrates, but no effect appears to have been made to explain scientifically this connection until the 18th century. In 1717, Lenkisi laid the foundation of subsequent investigations by his book Dinoxis palutum effluvius eromanque remedis. Later in the same century, two Englishmen, Pringle and Lind, made valuable contributions to the study of the disease, an example 
which has been worthily followed ever since by physicians serving in the British Army. France also has representatives in Faure, Maillot, Boudin, and many others, and it was the Frenchman Leveran, who in 1880 first discovered the malaria parasite. His work was extended by Golgi, Silly, and Machia Fava, and when Manson and others suggested, and Ross proved, the part played by the mosquito, the Italian school again came to the front with Grassi, Bignami, and Bastinelli, who showed what species of anilophiles in Italy can communicate to man the malaria parasite. Malaria in Greece did not attract much notice before the War of Independence. Makulok, writing in 1827, speaks of the devastation caused by it, and in 1829, Rux published his Histoire médicale de l'armée française en Mori. The work of Faure, Des Fevres Intermittents, it continues, published in 1833, contains some remarks referring to Greece. Under the year 1839, we find chronicled Thomas Huber die Weschelfeber in Griechenland. It was the experience of foreign troops in Greece that caused Littre, whose great edition of Hippocrates appeared between 1839 and 1861, to identify the fevers of the epidemics with the remitted fevers of modern Greece. Part was taken in the discussion to which Littre's book gave rise by Fuster and Conradi. Many papers dealing with various points in connection with malaria have appeared in the Greek medical journals during the last 50 years. The histories of medicine by Husserl and Dallenberg contain much valuable information about malaria in the ancient world, and Hirsch's work on historical and geographical pathology, 1881, describes accurately the malarial condition of Greece as it was then known. In 1884, Stephanos published La Grise au Point de vue naturelle, ethnologique, anthropologique, démographique, et médical, as part of the Dictionnaire Encyclopédique des Sciences Médicales. Stephanos took great pains to secure trustworthy helpers in collecting his materials, and even now his book is indispensable. The discovery of the manner in which malaria is spread gave a new impetus to study, and encouraged by the hopes now held up of combating the disease, a Greek league for the suppression of malaria was founded in 1905. Major R. Ross, who visited the country in 1906 to investigate the malaria on the Copaic Plain, has done much to explain to the public at home the work that is being carried on, and finally, in 1907, appeared in Illinoisia en Xiladae. The official record of the League for the first two years of its existence. In it there was published a paper by Professor A. Cousis, which was the first attempt to trace the history of malaria in Greece, from the earliest times to the present day, and Dr. Cartomatis discussed the same question with special reference to Athens. The peculiarly evil consequences of malaria have been at all times acknowledged. So far as I am aware, however, there was no systematic treatment of the question before Cabanus, who in 1815 published a work of which one section deals with the influence of intermittent fevers upon the character of the patient. This, it is plain, is but a small part of a much wider subject. Makulok was deeply impressed by the mischief that malaria causes, and his book, which is concerned chiefly with this and kindred topics, is marked throughout by a philosophic range of view and by thorough familiarity with the facts as they were known in his day. Subsequent discussion has been practically limited to obiter dicta, although these, e.g., the remarks in North's Roman fever and Celi's malaria, are often of the highest value. During the last 50 years, there has existed a tendency to regard the seriousness of the damage done by malaria as of less account than it appeared to previous investigators. I am not aware that any definite statement has been made to this effect, but writers have concentrated their attention on the cause and treatment of the disease rather than on its consequences. Two reasons for this change of view stand out prominently. In the first place, older writers often include under malaria many other fevers. Lockelock, for instance, attributes to it much suffering and loss, which he should have assigned to enteric. 
Throughout the history of tropical disease, as knowledge increases, enteric comes more and more to the front. Secondly, the wider adoption of rational treatment has made the disastrous results of malaria less conspicuous. Williams, writing in 1841, notices that the modern mode of treatment has so greatly diminished the severity of the paroxysm that these symptoms, coma, delirium, are rarely observed. Although Peruvian bark was tried medicinally in Spain as early as 1639, yet its employment in fevers, to which it is unsuited, and especially ignorance of the proper form and manner in which it should be administered, led to its discredit, even among some of the medical profession. While the poor throughout Europe clung to quack treatment, within the memory of the middle-aged men, Dr. Genovese of Colonia writes to tell me that fifty years ago the lower classes of Italy used to take pills of soot or cobweb, while the old physicians used quinine timidly, without judgment, and in small doses, relying chiefly upon bloodletting. Much improvement has taken place of late, although ignorance still abounds, and, to increase at least, the quinine that is sold to the poor is much adulterated. Eighty years ago, Mokolok complained of the great indifference displayed by Englishmen to the damage caused by malaria. The same complaint holds good today, in spite of the immense importance of the question to our colonies and dependencies. Many parts of Africa and India are scarcely habitable owing to the prevalence of marsh fever. Yet now, if ever, is the time for vigorous action. The discovery of Ross has made it possible greatly to diminish, if not altogether to banish the disease, and it is with the hope of arousing interest that I have ventured to estimate the part played by malaria in the history of one of the greatest nations of antiquity. End of section 1section two of malaria and greek history by william henry samuel jones and edward theodore withington this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings from the public domain for more information or volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by leon harvey chapter one malaria in modern greece the present malarious condition of greece is a fair indication of the state of the country in classical times the surface of the land has changed to a certain extent, and without doubt the amount of malaria has fluctuated greatly. But nevertheless, a comparison of the two epochs brings out, amid some differences, a remarkable similarity. If due care be taken, the gaps in our knowledge of the classical period may be supplied by well-ascertained facts about modern Greece. At no time has the inquirer had better or more abundant material at his disposal, the earlier attempts to ascertain the prevalence of malaria in the country, however careful and conscientious, were very imperfect, owing to the amount of research and the number of collaborators required. But the work of Hirsch and Stephanos is now superseded by the laborious compilations of the Greek Anti-Malaria League. This society, founded on the model of similar institutions in Italy and elsewhere, came into being at the beginning of the year 1905, just before a severe epidemic of malaria broke out. The work of the League is roughly as follows. In the first place, it is necessary accurately to estimate the prevalence of the disease throughout the country. Before the League began to collect evidence, the only available records were the statistics of various hospitals and the mortality tables of the twelve largest Greek towns. As country districts are, generally speaking, far more malarious than cities, much careful inquiry is necessary before the extent of the work to be done by the League is exactly known. Reports have been sent to Athens by many country physicians, but this part of the work of the League is not yet complete. The education of both the laity and the medical profession in the new discoveries, which have made it possible to stamp out malaria, is another necessary yet very difficult task. The physicians, being well trained and highly intelligent men, are ready enough to keep abreast of the times, but among the people who, of course, must work at their own salvation, ignorance, stupidity, and difference are rife. Accordingly, lectures are being given, circulars distributed to suitable persons, and notices put up in public places. Every means that experience suggests is being employed to the utmost. To fight malaria successfully and speedily requires a combination of two methods of procedure. A. The draining of the marshes or the extermination of the 
and of felines, b. The killing by quinine of the parasites in the blood of infected persons. In theory, either method, thoroughly applied, would exterminate the disease, but in practice it is found necessary to employ both. To dry up the marshes around the large Greek lakes involves engineering difficulties which may be overcome in time. By the removal of the small puddles and ditches caused by imperfect irrigation or the drying up in summer of mountain torrents is a much easier task. Even when this procedure is not feasible, to cover the surface of stagnant water with oil or other suitable substance is sufficient greatly to diminish the number of mosquitoes. The distribution of quinine is a serious difficulty. The poor often cannot afford to buy it, and even when they can, its purity is very uncertain, as unscrupulous tradesmen are in the habit of selling a mixture that contains but little quinine. A government monopoly seems to be the only way out of a most unsatisfactory position. The highly malarious condition of Greece may be seen from a few statistics. The following are the deaths from malaria in the 12 largest towns for the year 1905, 1906 and 1907. A table is displayed on the page, listing cities compared to the years and deaths recorded. The average mortality in malarial sickness is, for Greece, 1 in 176. Taking the census of 1896, we obtain the following percentages of sickness for malarial disease. A table is displayed on the page comparing the years 1905, 1906 and 1907 to a list of cities and the number of cases and present. It is obvious that these figures can only be approximately correct, especially as the census for which the population is taken is now more than 11 years old. Nevertheless, the evidence is enough to prove that in the Greek towns the number of malaria cases varies considerably from year to year, and that percentage may be anything from zero to a very high figure, according to the healthiness or unhealthiness of the locality. Many other statistical estimates show how severe is the scourge under which Greek is suffering. As Ross says, the Greek army is as badly infected as was our Indian army some time ago. The table is displayed on the page, compared to the year, to the average strength of the army, the case of malarial sickness, and the percentage. Calculations made from the admissions to Athenian hospitals show that the various kinds of malaria occur at Athens in the following proportions. 1. Intermittent fevers, Dola Punta Spiratoi, 91.52%. 2. Remitted fevers, Ephesimoi Peritoi, 3.44%. 3. Pernicious fevers, Cacoithis Peritoi, 30%. 4. Blackwater fever, Amos Fai Rinora Cori Peritoi, 0.06%, 5. Malarial Cachexia, 4.66%. For Greece generally, the proportions are 1. 91.67%, 2. 6%, 3. 27%, 4. 0.09%, 5. 1.95%. Out of 125 cases of pernicious malaria in the Greek army, no less than 113 were of the comatose form, while in 2,610 cases of intermittent fever, 2,020 were quotidian, 518 tertian, and 72 quartan. For Greece generally, out of 28,157 cases, 20,789 were quotidian, 6,840 tertian, and 528 quartan. This gives 73.83%, 24.30%, and 1.87% respectively. As to the age of the patients, Dr. Katamatis gives the following summary. Table displayed on the page, listing between the ages, the occurrence, and percentage of the cases. The periods of the year when malaria is most common may be seen from the army statistics for the years 1882 to 1886. Out of 14,027 cases of malaria, a table is displayed on the page, read the number of cases of malaria to the occurrence by month. These figures may be compared with those from the Athenian hospitals, which give a table displayed on the page, comparing the percentages of the cases to each month. The cases that occur in winter are chiefly relapses. Chill, fatigue or other strain brings out the malaria, which has been latent since the warmer months. 
Professor Salas gives a very complete summary of the statistics sent to the League by doctors practicing in the various districts of Greece. A table displayed on the page listing the proportion of the inhabitants suffering from malaria to district. Attica, 10% in some places, 100% in others, Marathon. Aegina, the disease is rare. Megaris, in Eleusis, 5%. In Erythrae, 60 to 72% of the school children had enlarged spleens. Thebes, little is yet known. Levadia, there are great variations and fluctuations, e.g., in the Dios, Levadia, the proportion was 75% in 1905 and 20% in 1906. In Cherolina, 100% in 1905 and 10 to 15% in 1906. Physiotis, 75% in 1905, 12% in 1906. Parnassus, in most places about 10%. Locris, in Atalanta, 50%. Elsewhere, 10 to 30%. Doris, 15 to 50%. Acronania in Mesolungi, 15 to 20%. Macrinia, 60 to 70%. Perochilotis, 60%. Olenia, 70%. Triconia, 5 to 30%. Uritania, very slight. Norpactia, in Norpactus, 30 to 50%, elsewhere 10 to 30%. Funetia and Zeromeros, in some places as high as 100%. Norplia, 1 to 50%. Argos, few cases in the capital, elsewhere 10 to 50%. Corinthia, 5 to 70%. Spitze and Hermionis, little malaria except in Hermion. Hydra, 3 to 4%. Trezenia, 2 to 35%. Cythera, little in Cythera itself, in one district, 40 to 60%. Mantinia, from 4% to 80% in Okomanos and Mantinia. Sinoria, 10 to 50%. Gortinia, 25%. Megalopolis, 20 to 40%. Patras, 10 to 60%. Agelia, 50 to 90%. Calavatilia, little over 50%. Elia, little malaria in the hill districts, in other places 10 to 50%. Lestemian, in the plain of Hedos, all are attacked. In the highlands, 3-5% to 5 only. Elsewhere, about 20%. Epidoros, Lemuria, 14-24%. In some parts, nearly 100%. Gothian, 2-10%. Otoilos, 5-15%. Messene, 15-30%. Palia, 40%. Trifilia, 3-40%. Olympia, 10-70%. Chalcus, 5-80%. Zirocorion, 20-25%. Keristia, 15-60%. Scopolos, 8-10%. Cyrus, 2-50%. Zia, Kia, 1-3%. In 1905, 40%. Andros, 1-3%. Tenos, little except in Panormolos. Naxos, 10-45%. Thera, there is little malaria. Corfu, 10-60%. Lucas, 15 to 70%. Cephalinia, but little malaria, likewise in Ithaca. Psychanthos, 1 to 10%. Arta, Arta, 30%. Comeno and Bani, 80 to 100%. Larissa, 15 to 80%. Ternavos, 40 to 100%. Aegea, 20 to 50%. Follow. The amount of malaria varies greatly. 2-3%, 10%, 20%, 25%, 30%, in different places. Hameros, 8-25%. Farsala, 10-40%. Domakos, 66% in Militea. Trikala, 15-37%. Kalabaka, 2-25%. Kreditsa, 5-75%. The amount of malaria in modern Greece fluctuates considerably from year to year. Thus, the proportion of malaria patients in the total number of sick people treated in the Astycliniki Athenian was 56.36% in 1865, but only 19.93% in 1867. Since 1890, the proportion has varied from 25.49% to 8.88%, 
and there has been a considerable diminution in the last ten years in spite of the epidemic of 1905. For the year 1905, the Anti-Malarial League received from physicians throughout the country reports dealing with a population of 448,068. Of these, 2,016 and 909 fell sick. In the islands of the Gulf of Aegina, the proportion was 21%. In the Aegean Islands, 41%. In Euboea, 28%. In the Ionian Islands, 26.59%. In Thessaly, 74%. In the rest of Greece, about 50%. It is calculated that, out of a total population of 2,433,806, no fewer than 960,048 were attacked by malaria, and 5,916 died. The reports of the physicians contain, besides bare statistics, information which will be important when we come to consider the effects of malaria in ancient Greece. 1. The writers are unanimous that, although no age is spared, children are the great sufferers for malarial disease. There is therefore a tendency for the infection to fall upon different persons in different years. In other words, a large proportion of the population becomes infected in time. 2. Nearly all the writers point out that the customers sleeping in the open, either to avoid the stuffy heat of the house, or because the necessities of agriculture demand it, is the cause of much illness. 3. Malaria has in many places become less common and less severe during recent years. This is due partially to drainage, partially to improved treatment and the use of quinine. 4. Many sick never come out of the physician's notice at all, so that the amount of malaria in the country is probably much greater than the amount reported. 5. The evil consequences are seen in the following ways. a. The most malarious districts are also the most fertile. B. The loss of time and money is very great. C. The effect upon the rising generation is most disastrous. D. The victims of malaria or cachetia are weakened in body and mind. E. The inhabitants of malarious districts age and die prematurely. The reader of these reports is struck, not only by the number of districts where more than 75% of the population fall victims to malaria every year, but also by the extent of the land capable of fostering the disease in years of epidemic paludism. Even in a dry region such as Attica, the number of possible foci is very great, and when the whole of Greece has been surveyed for the purpose of estimating the amount of marsh land, the malaria map of the country will show a dangerous state of affairs. Apart from the permanent marshes, there are many other collections of water that afford good breeding places to the mosquitoes. As is well known, the Enophilines prefer small puddles on the ground. The innumerable valleys of Greece are easily flooded, while the mountain torrents, by overflowing their banks or by partially drying up, give rise to a series of small pools. Accordingly, a wet winter, followed by a dry summer, is most apt to cause an epidemic. The present malarious state of Greece must be a matter of surprise to many. In England, at least, although it was recognised that Greece suffered some loss from malaria, Few readers of the articles written by Major Ross fail to be struck by the obscurity in which the condition of the country has been kept to the row. The inhabitants, accustomed to the disease, and perhaps influenced by the fatalism which so often accompanies it, have not proclaimed from the housetops their unhappy condition. If therefore, if the old Greek literature does not insist much upon the prevalence of malaria, it must not be inferred that the country was healthy. Owing to the absence of statistics, it is not possible accurately to measure the extent to which ancient Greece was infected. But although changes favouring the disease have occurred since the classical period, these are counterbalanced by the improved treatment of modern times, and especially by the use of quinine. The ordinary literature may not contain as much evidence as might have been expected, yet the great attention paid to malaria by the medical writers shows how large a part is played in the lives of the inhabitants. End of section 2. Section 3 of Malaria in Greek History by William Henry Samuel Jones and Edward Theodore Withington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 2. Malaria in the Non-Medical Greek Writers. In fact, says Dannenberg, 
the great disease of Greece, islands and mainland, that which puts its impress on all the other affections of the country, is this remittent or pseudo continuous fever. If to remittent malaria be added to intermittent forms of the disease, the statement is perfectly correct, and represents a truth of great importance for the students of Greek life and Greek history. In considering the question, it will be convenient to divide the inquiry into two parts, and to examine separately the non-medical and the medical evidence. The first mention of paretos, the most general term for fever, is in Homer, who states that the dog star brings much paretos upon miserable mortals. As summer and autumn are the times when malaria is most prevalent in modern Greece, it has been supposed that here, there, is conclusive evidence that malaria was well known in the prehistoric period. If this view be correct, it should be remembered that the words of the poet must not be taken to include the whole of Greece, but only that part of it, probably the west coast of Asia Minor, with which he was best acquainted. The term pyridos might be employed to designate typhoid, which also is an autumnal disease. But I should certainly be inclined to identify it with malaria, were it not for the comment of the scholist upon this passage. It is as follows. The notice of the word paretos is to be found only here, and that it is used in the ordinary sense of the word, and not as some take it to signify the heat of the atmosphere. The commentator notices, in fact, that Paretos occurs but once in Homer, and that there was some authority for the interpretation heat. Now, fever is certainly the more natural meaning. And I can only account for the fact that the other view was not uncommon, by supposing a tradition existed that fever was unknown in Homer's day. Otherwise, it is hard to see why any doubt was entertained at all. Too much stress must not be laid upon this comment, but at least it leaves the mind in an uncertainty which otherwise perhaps would never have arisen. The word Pabellos does not occur again before the 5th century, and during this long interval, the inquirer has to make what use he can of vague and general references. Indeed, throughout the whole of the non-medical literature, the sure tests of malaria, periodicity and a large spleen are readily mentioned. The conjunction of disease and marshy land is, as a rule, the most trustworthy sign to be obtained. Cardamatus holds that the plague which infected the Greek army before Troy may have been malaria, caused by the marshy nature of the district in which the camp was pitched. It does not seem wise to press too far the words of a poet, who must always be vague in referring to disease, but if he had any particular sickness in mind, it may well have been typhus or typhoid, disorders which have often proved disastrous in wartime. The other references to disease in the Homeric poems are vaguer still. In the island of Syria there is no death, and no hateful sickness falls on wretched mortals. In this passage the poet appears to be thinking of disease in general, but more in particular of the famine plagues, usually of the nature of typhus, which occurs so frequently in early civilization before the importation of corn makes the inhabitants independent of the local harvests. There appear to be no other places in Homer where even a likely guess can be made as to the nature of the diseases prevalent in his day. In Hesoid, diseases are mentioned two or three times, but here again is it impossible to determine their character, except in the famous line where famine and plague are coupled together. It is certainly most noteworthy that no clear reference is made to malaria, for Boeotia, the country in which Hesoid lived, is very marshy, and particularly favourable to the growth of the mosquito. The nearest approach to a reference, but it surely can't be regarded as such, is to be found in Works, 416 to 418. Suidas says that the name Epelates, used by Homer and Hesoid, was sometimes applied to Og, but in the context makes it clear that this meaning of the word is not necessarily that in which it was used by the early poets. In fact, Suidas appears to have confused Epelates with Pedotos a word which must receive full treatment later. On the whole, the evidence is in favour of the view that malaria was unknown to a soid, for it is scarcely conceivable that, had existed in his day where he lived, he would have omitted to mention it as one of the plagues of the farmer during the hot months. It is also most unlikely that malaria was a Boeotian disease in prehistoric times, for in the western shores of Lake Copaeus, 
now one of the most unhealthy districts of Greece and scarcely habitable. There dwelt a proverbially rich people whose city was the famous Ocominas. This flourishing state of the country is quite incompatible with the presence in it of such a deadly enemy as endemic malaria. And, had malaria existed at all, it must have become endemic at once owing to the neighbourhood of mosquito breeding marshes. The early inhabitants of Greece seem to have chosen deliberately sites which in later times were among the most malarious in the country. This is surely strong evidence that at first they were healthy. There is nothing of importance to chronicle in the literature of the period between Hesoid and Theognis, that is, from 700 BC to nearly 550 BC. But in the latter poet, there is a passage that requires the most careful consideration. Theognis, a supporter of the oligarchical party in Megara, is enlarging upon the miseries awaiting the citizen who is not wealthy, and he asserts that nothing crushes a good man so much as poverty neither old age, nor yet Ipialos. The word Ipialos has a most uncertain history, and whatever be the etymological connection, if any, between the words, it was early confused with Ephaelets and Epaios. But it is clear that there was, one, a giant Ephaelets, son of Elos, and two, a demon Epaios. This demon was supposed to cause nightmare, the cold shiver which was sometimes called Epaios. In all probability, Epaios also at one time meant nightmare. Indeed, a German commentator on Theognis 174 calls poverty a nightmare or ghost that binds and harasses a man. Penia, quasi incubo vel larva quae cutam est hominem vinciens et vexans. But Epaios so they meant in later times, og, or the shivers that preceded, although the scholist on Aristophanes' wasps, 1038, mentions an interpretation which identified the word with Epalus, Tiphys, Euopas. The confusion between the two meanings, nightmare, og, is well illustrated by the passage in the wasps, 1037 and 1041, and the poet says that he attacked last year the Epiolos, and the fevers that were strangling your sires by night and throttling your grandsires. Lying down upon the beds of your easy-going folk, they were concocting against them affidavits, summonses, and testimonies. The sense of nightmares suits the passage admirably, and with Epiolos are connected fevers. Hesius calls Epiolos the shivers preceding fever. Gallen defines it as a protracted quotidian of such a kind that the patient felt fever and shivering at one and the same time and in every part of the body, adding that some Attic writers so name the shivers that precede fever. Even in Aristophanes, the word distinctly has this meaning. Besides a fragment of the poet which clearly states this, there is a reference in the Achartians, date 425 BC, three years before the wasps, to a man returning home after riding on horseback, with an attack of the Epulos upon him. This is a certain example of the truth that an attack of malaria may, in a malarious country, originate in any violent bodily exertion. It seems likely that the shivers which are so symptomatic of a malarial attack caused the disease to be called, by the Athenians at least, perhaps on its first introduction, nightmare sickness, and that afterwards, when the various types became more familiar through long experience, the name Upiolos was used more particularly of malaria characterised by pronounced shivering, while it was often applied to the shivering itself. It is therefore quite possible that the passage in Theognis does refer to malaria, in which case the disease was well known on the mainland of Greece as early as the second half of the 6th century BC, although the evidence cannot be regarded as conclusive. The account of the Ionian Greeks of Asia Minor, given by Herodotus, would lead one to suppose that they also had become infected by this date. But here again no certain inference is possible. It is related that Dionysus, the energetic leader of the Phocians, offered to train the badly disciplined Greek crews of the fleet which had been collected to resist the Persians. For a week the Greeks persevered, 
when, worn out by unaccustomed exertions and the heat, they refused to practice their drill any longer. Many of them had fallen ill, and many more were expecting the same fate. It is indeed hard to believe that any other disease except malaria could produce so much sickness in so short a time, while if the Greeks were already infected, unusual exertion would certainly have precipitated attacks of fever. There can be little doubt that Magna Graecia was malarious. Strabo says that Posidonia was made unhealthy by the marshes near it, although, of course, he is no authority for early times. Croton, on the other hand, as thorough in marked contrast with the rest of the neighbourhood, was proverbial for the good health of its inhabitants, and since Archilochus speaks of the lovely land of Sirius, it may be that this district also, at least in early times, did not suffer much from malarial disease. Both Diodorus and Strabo mention the fortunate position of Sabaris, but in all probability they are referring to the extraordinary fertility of the soil. But Athenius, on the authority of Timaeus, gives us information which leaves little doubt that Sabaris was malarious. Among the causes that provoked the Sabarites to luxurious habits, he mentions the position of the town, which being in a hollow, was in summer excessively hot at midday and very cold in the morning and evening. Hence arose a saying that he, who did not wish to die young, ought to avoid in Sabaris seeing the sun either when it rose or when it set. This advice is often given to dwellers in malarious regions, as chill is almost certain to precipitate an attack of fever, and further, mosquitoes bite most at night. It should be remembered that the descriptions of life in Sabaris are all much latter than the destruction of the city. Later writers were wont to dwell upon the laziness and effeminacy of its inhabitants, but these faults have been much exaggerated. The prosperity of Sabaris necessarily implies energy and determination. The evil reputation of the Sabarites is due to distorted versions of their attempts to counteract the unhealthiness of their environment. But after making all necessary deductions for the bias of late historians, enough remains to show that the malarious nature of the district and the dread of fever exercised a most pernicious influence and undoubtedly contributed to the ruin of the country. It has been suggested that there were drainage works which diminished the amount of the disease. The recent excavations in Crete have shown that the ancients had quite advanced ideas on sanitary science, but it is clear that Ephesus had a system of sewers. Nevertheless, it seems unlikely that malaria was prevalent in Siberius when the city was founded. Not only would colonists avoid, if possible, an unhealthy site, but the rapid rise of the city to a prosperity that was proverbial forbids us to suppose that the inhabitants were much hindered by malarial disease. Pioneers always suffer most, as the story of the Panama Canal plainly shows. When the district became malarious cannot be known, but it is certain that the disease increased until the dreadful condition resulted, which is to be seen at the present day. This increase is probably due to changes in the course of the rivers, which have considerably extended the surface of marsh and swamp. Geographical changes have likewise been the ruin of certain sites in Asia Minor. The silting up of the rivers has turned the whole country of Miletus into a pestilential swamp, and the same agency has been at work in Ephesus. And Miletus, Apollo, and Artemis were identified with the sun and moon, and worshipped as the sources of healthy climate as well as of pestilence. The city, therefore, was probably malarious, but not to such a degree as to make it uninhabitable. The third Fithian ode, written by Pindar about 470 BC, refers to the hot plagues from which Hero of Syracuse was suffering and to the medical education of Aesculapius, who was taught by Chiron to cure men wasted in summer heat or the chill of winter. Pindar, then, must have been familiar with fevers, and also with diseases particularly prevalent in summer. Of such malaria is a striking example. Writing about the middle of the 5th century, Empedocles speaks of chill diseases, and we are reminded of the story that this physician and philosopher delivered Silenus from a plague by draining its marshes, or by turning two rivers into them. Herodotus, although he does not use the word paretos 
to denote any disease, informs us that the Greeks transformed into Peretos the name Porata, which belonged to a tributary of the Ister. This surely seems to show that in his day the Greeks were wont to associate fever with rivers and streams. The verb perisol occurs for the first time about the same period, being used by Euripides and Phericrates, although in neither case does it necessarily refer to malaria. It is in the Odius Tyrannus of Sophocles that a fairly complete description of a pestilence first occurs in non-medical literature. The date of the play is uncertain, but is put by Jeb between 429 and 420. Upon the city of Thebes has fallen a great disaster, blighted are the fruits of the earth, blighted the herds of cattle and the barren pangs of women. With all the fever god sweeping down, a dreadful plague is ravaging the city. The passage would clearly recall to the minds of the Athenian audience the fearful ravages caused by the great plague of 430, for which perhaps they were still suffering. But the details, the disease among men, moraine among the cattle, and blight on the crops, certainly suggest one of those great famine plagues so common in the early history of every nation, which would most certainly remain as a vivid tradition, even when the advance of trade and civilization they had become rare, if not altogether things of the past. But again the effect upon childbirth is strongly suggestive of malaria. There is other evidence for the view that malaria became common in Attica between 429 and 422, and the truth seems to be that Sophocles has united in one picture the symptoms of three different diseases, one of which was remembered as a tradition, while the other two formed part of the personal experience of his audience. The Wasps of Ristovanes, brought in the year 422, contains three references to fever, and these with the quotation from the Acronarians, date 425, that from these fragments which have already been given are the only occasions when malaria is mentioned in the players of the poets still extant. It is surely hard not to suppose that in the year 422 malaria was, for some reason or other, a disease very much talked about among the Athenians, especially when, in their parabasis of the wasps, Aristophanes claims credit for attacking the orgs and fevers last year. The language is certainly figurative, referring to people who were regarded as objectionable, but it becomes most full of meaning if the Athenians had recently suffered from an epidemic of fevers attended by shivering. In an earlier part of the play, the chorus expressed surprise that the keen old juryman, Philocleon, is so long in joining his companions. But perhaps, they say, he has a swelling in the groin, or may be the escape of the rascal yesterday has vexed him so that now he lies sick of a fever. A swollen spleen is typical of malaria, and this complaint may be alluded to in the first part of my quotient. With the second there should be compared the words of Sir Samuel Baker. In this country, any group of mind will ensure an attack of fever, when all are more or less predisposed during the unhealthy season from the commencement of July to the end of October. The last allusion to fever in Aristophanes occurs towards the middle of the play, where Philocleon congratulates himself on the new arrangement, whereby he can play the juryman in his own house, because even if he have a fever, he will nevertheless continue to draw his pay. I conclude from the wasps that malaria was attracting particular attention at Athens to the last quarter of the 5th century. It was called the nightmare disease, although the simple term fever, paretos, was also used to denote it. When the disease is first introduced into a country, it attacks anybody, old or young, although it is most conspicuous among adults. After a time, when the disease has passed from the epidemic to the endemic stage, the old are partially immune, because they have probably had several attacks during their childhood. Surely it is not a mere coincidence that Philocleon, who is twice mentioned as subject to fever, is an old man, while the fever is orgs throttled the sires and grandsires of the Athenian people. Malaria, then, was a comparatively new disease in Attica when Aristophanes wrote The Wasps, although it certainly existed in other parts of Greece long before. This conclusion is quite in harmony with the a priori inference that could be drawn from the geographical condition of the district. Attica is a dry country, 
and not so well adapted as other parts of Greece to the growth of the mosquitoes which carry malaria from man to man. Plutarch, says that Pericles, seems to have died of a mild attack of the plague, but he does not vouch for the truth of the statement. It may well be that the recrudescences of this mysterious malady were different in any type from the earlier cases, but the symptoms as given by Plutarch are strongly suggestive of malaria. The disease of Pericles was not acute or intense, syntono, but long and of a sluggish, flicra nature. It was characterized by the variety of its phases, and it slowly wore away the strength and mental powers of the patient. If Pericles died of malaria, and the evidence is by no means conclusive, the passage from Plutarch has a special interest, for Theophrastus, from whom the story appears to be derived, quoted it as showing that moral states correspond to physical changes. Diodorus Siculus refers to the recurrences of the Athenian plague. The same writer also mentions two epidemics that are said to have occurred in quite early times. The details given point clearly to malaria. If Diodorus is recording a true tradition, it must be inferred that epidemics of malaria were not uncommon in prehistoric Greece. But how little trust can be put in a latter author who attempts to record early pestilences is obvious when we turn to his account of the plague of 426 BC. The Athenians, he says, suffered severe losses from the pestilence, then in setting forth the causes of the disease, he gives what is undoubtedly a malarial constitution. He relates that during the winter there may have been heavy rains, which had covered the country with swamps. The heat of the following summer drew up poisonous exhalations from the damp ground, and so the atmosphere was corrupted. A thing which is obviously seen to happen on unhealthy marshes. Obviously, Diodorus has confused plague and malaria in this case, and therefore no weight can be attached to his account of prehistoric epidemics. It is, however, very remarkable that, in describing recruitances of the same pestilence, Diodorus mentions the atmospheric conditions that cause malaria, and Plutarch gives malarial symptoms. The conclusion to be drawn is that either malaria was the most common type of pestilence in later times, so that writers were tempted to confuse it with other diseases, or else there was an anecdote during the early years of the Peloponnesian War, a serious epidemic of malaria, which was afterwards identified with the plague. If malaria became epidemic in Attica soon after the plague of 430 BC, it would be natural to find that sickness increased after that date. As a matter of fact, disease did not become more common, as will be shown presently, but I admit that it may have been due to other causes and not only to malaria. A statue of Health Athena was set up on the Athenian Acropolis between 429 and 400. The cult was an old one, although there must have been some special reason for this renewal of the worship of the health goddess, and malaria might be the cause just as well as a plague, with which this statue is usually brought into connection. Arifon's famous hymn to health is one of about the same date. Finally, the worship of Aesculapus, the god of healing, was introduced into Athens from Epidarius towards the close of the 5th century. His festivals were Ta Ascalaperia in March to April, the beginning of the Greek malarial season, and Ta Epidavria in September, the height of the malarial season. This cumulative evidence tends towards the conclusion that during the period of which we are speaking, ill health was distinctly on the increase. It may be objected that a fevered patient would be most unlikely to incubate in a temple of Asclepius, and certainly there are no such cases recorded among the votive tablets discovered by Cavadius in the sanctuary at Epidarius. The greater number of the illnesses, says the writer, are those against which medicine is powerless. There are blind men who see, lame who walk, but nevertheless, the chronic maladies that are so often the result of malaria, such as anemia, derangement of the digestive organs, and dropsy, are likely enough to have brought the sufferers to the temple of the god, in the hope that, where man had failed, the power of heaven might succeed. With the close of the 5th century and the beginning of the 4th, the time is reached when references to fevers became much more numerous. Thucydides is best considered in conjunction with Plato, but Xenophon may well be taken separately. 
in Xenophon occurs convincing testimony that, in his day, it was generally recognised that some diseases are connected, in a special sense, with certain districts. If, says the father of Cyrus, you intend to stay some time in one place, you must not neglect the health of your camp. It is an easy matter, if only can be taken, for the inhabitants never cease talking about unhealthy and healthy regions, and their physique and complexions are trustworthy evidence in both cases. Remembering that malaria stunts the growth of its victims, enlarges their spleen, sometimes to an enormous size, and produces a dusky complexion, we conclude that the disease was common and much discussed, and that its tendency to haunt certain localities was perfectly recognised. Drosen had a peculiarly bad reputation, for the speaker in his Agenetics of Isocrates points out the fear with which a party of fugitives approaches the place. A fear was amply justified, seeing that all the exiles apparently fell ill while two of them died. Onchestus in Boeotia was another town notorious for the prevalence of malaria, not unnaturally, as it was situated near the Copaic Lake. The journey of the 10,000 across Asia was wonderfully healthy, and nothing is said about malaria, but Chirisophus died through injudicious treatment while suffering from fever, and fever by this time was certainly the name of malaria rather than of any other disease. King Aegis Polis died of a violent calenture, which attacked him in the height of summer, soon after he had captured Tyrone. Finally, Socrates is presented by Xenophon as answering the questioner, who asked if he knew anything good by the retort, good for what, for fever? Obviously the Athenian of 400 BC was familiar enough with the malady. In a district where enteric is prevalent, the remark, he has the fever, will in the mouth of a layman refer to that disease and not to scarlatina. A medical man, however, would apply the term fever to both. Similarly, in Greece, although by peritos, physicians might mean any fever. The ordinary public, at least, after Aristophanes, generally meant by it the prevalent disease, namely malaria. Thucydides never used peritos at all, even when he was describing the feverish symptoms of the plague. He employed instead kavma, or thermi, just as though he was afraid of causing misapprehension if he used an expression which, in the common speech, was in his day of a peculiar and limited application. But Galen, the professional man, has no such fears, and when describing the same plague, uses peritos twice within a few lines. Turning now to Plato, who is the first among non-medical writers carefully to distinguish the various kinds of fevers, we find a remarkable confirmation of our conclusion that peritos, after the veins had a specific and not a general meaning, and in most cases, except in the medical writings, could be translated malaria. In the Timaeus, the date of which is uncertain, but probably falls between 380 and 360 BC, those diseases which are caused by excesses of one element are divided into a. Continuous calentures, kavmata, and fevers, peritaus, caused by excessive fire, per. B. Quotidians, ephemerineos, caused by excessive air. C. Tertians, triteos, caused by excessive water. D. Quartans, tetarteos, caused by excessive earth. It is to be observed that Plato's classification is meant to be exhaustive. Classes B, C and D give the regular intermittent fevers which are called by the technical names so common in the medical writers and so rare everywhere else. Class A contains virulent continuous calentures, such as the plague, and continuous fevers. The word kavma, then as used by both Thucydides and Plato, may well denote non-malarial fever. But what of continuous fevers? Synechius Tiletoi, in the medical writers, the phrase denotes any fevers, malarial or non-malarial, that do not intermit, but as Calentur obviously covers the non-malarial group. I am of opinion that in Plato, the Xenegius Tiretoi are remitted malarial fevers. It is quite certain that the adjective Xenegius was at first applied to both a remitted and a continuous fever, 
so that their use of the term presents no difficulty. Further, if this view be taken, the classification of fevers becomes quite complete. Class A. 1. Continuous calenturids. 2. Remitted fevers. Classes B, C, D. 3. Intermittent fevers. At any rate, we may be certain that in the common speech, peritos did not include typhoid or any such infectious disease. In the problems of Aristotle, is pronounced the question, why is that those who approach a patient suffering from consumption, ophthalmia or itch, catch the disease, while dropsy, fevers, apoplexy and other diseases are not catching? The word peritoi did not, at least in the mouth of a layman, include infectious fevers. Accordingly, it must usually have meant malaria. The other references to fever in the works of Plato tell us very little, except that it was a common complaint. A passage of the Phaedo implies that it was prevalent enough to be chosen to represent the specific diseases, while in the lesser alcabades it is classed with gout and ophthalmia, to show that these three common ailments by no means exhaust the catalogue of sickness. It is unfortunate that in the numerous other places in Plato's writings where fever is mentioned, the context throws little or no light upon the extent to which malaria was prevalent during the early part of the 4th century. When, however, the other evidence is taken into consideration, it is perhaps not rash to conclude that fever was chosen to stand for disease in general because malaria was so familiar to every Athenian. It is likely enough that Plato is copying a peculiarity of the historical Socrates, who may well have appealed to the prevalence among the Athenians of a disease which, as I tried to show above, was of comparatively recent introduction into Attica. There are many references to fevers, and even to phrenitis and lethargos, which are certainly kinds of remittent or continuous malarial fever, in the fragments of the comic poets, but only two of them call for special comment. The first is a fragment of Alexis, which shows that fever, to a Greek, generally signified an intermittent, and the other, already quoted above, declares Onchestus to be the most malarious place in Boeotia. Fever is not often mentioned in the Oratoris. A. Shines tells us that on a certain occasion two cases occurred among the Amphictyons at Delphi. These may or may not have been cases of malaria. As Delphi was constantly receiving visitors from all parts of the Greek world, cases of infectious disease must have arisen there. Of a hundred youths sent by the chance to Delphi, only two returned. All the rest were killed by the pestilence. Such a high rate of mortality points to some disease of the nature of typhus rather than to malaria, and so it would be wrong to infer that Delphi was particularly malarious. Demosthenes, when he talks of a period or excess of fever, shows that in his eyes at least pereptos usually meant an intermittent fever. But, as might be expected, references to the disease are not very common in his works. There is, however, one interesting passage. The speaker is stating the results of a rough handling, and remarks that, although the wounds were not serious in themselves, continuous fevers followed which caused his life to be despaired of. In fact, said the physician, had not hemorrhage occurred, the patient must have died. This may or may not be malaria, supervening upon severe bodily strain. If it be a case of this disease, the fever must have been remittent and not intermittent, since it is called continuous, and so far as I know, this objective is applied to fevers only here, in one passage of Plato, and in the medical writers. In fact, it belonged to the dentical phraseology of the physicians, and is plain that in this passage we have the doctor's words reported almost verbatim, for the language is everywhere that of the Hippocratic writings. References to fever in the works of Aristotle are very numerous. Some of them may be dismissed at once, as they merely show that malaria was not uncommon at the close of the 4th century. But there are other passages which deemed fuller treatment. In one place it is said that the term cause is used in the sense in which the moon is called the cause of a solar eclipse, and fatigue the cause of fever. Only in a highly malarious country could it be said, without qualification, that overexertion will cause fever, because when a person is the subject of latent malaria, any strain will precipitate an attack, and it is for this reason that cases break out in non-epidemic country like England. The infection takes place abroad, the attack occurs at home, weeks, months or even years afterwards, 
but the most valuable information about malaria is to be found in the suedo aristotelian problems. It is here stated that fevers are most common in summer, that spring and autumn are unhealthy, that damp marshy places are unhealthy, that a dry summer following upon a rainy period is deadly, especially for children, and that quartans are common at such a time. In another passage, consumption, ophthalmia, and the itch are said to be infectious, fevers non-infectious. We must not assume from this that no infectious fevers were to be found in Greece, because plague, loimos, is said to attack those who come into contact with the patient, and under this term might well be included typhus, typhoid, and even epidemic malaria. But it certainly may be inferred that the ordinary fevers were malarial. Splenic diseases are mentioned, besides Epiolos, and the burning disease, Kafsos. Of great importance also is a statement that the inhabitants of marshy districts age rapidly. It may be concluded from this evidence that Greece, as Aristotle knew it, was highly malarious. The latter comic poets afford but little information about the disease of their time, and the references to malaria that occur in them have already been given. Theophrastus, in his treatise on winds, says that dry south winds bring fevers, and the twelfth chapter of the characters gives as a characteristic of the unseasonable man that he will serenade his mistress when a fever is upon her. This last quotation proves that malaria was a common complaint at Athens during the early portion of the third century. But from this period onwards, there is a gap in our sources. We should not become copious enough to afford much help for the time of Plutarch. Scantiness of the evidence, particularly that dealing with the parts of Greece outside Attica, is a great hindrance to the present inquiry, and it is especially unfortunate that literature is less plentiful just at the time when it is reasonable to suppose that malaria was at its height. But Alexander possibly died of malaria, and we know that Philopomon suffered from fever. A character in Bion reminds us that autumn was very unhealthy, and there is no reason to suppose that the remark applied to a few districts only. We are indeed told by Strabo that Alexandria, in spite of its sight, was free from marsh fever even in his time. It is to be inferred from this that damp places were generally known to be unhealthy, so that exceptions to the rule were noticed by observers as a remarkable phenomena. Very few such exemptions are on record, and the conclusion is inevitable that a considerable part of the Greek world was notoriously malarious. Eritrea is mentioned as being unhealthy in the time of Menedemus, who flourished shortly after the time of Alexander. Among the moral treatises of Plutarch is included a work, the Latin name of which is De Tunda Senatete Precepta. It is intended for the use of those who devote themselves to study or politics, Y37C, and lays down the rules which must be observed by such if they wish to keep in health. At first sight it appears to be a sensible but somewhat commonplace series of remarks, but a more careful reading proves that it throws a flood of light upon the hygienic conditions of the period when it was composed. Before proceeding I will give a short analysis of the contents. It is necessary to keep the hands warm, as chill in the extremities invites fever. 123a. It is useful to accustom the body when in health to the diet which would be necessary in illness, and it should not be thought insufferable to dine unbathed. 123 B.D. The body ought to be nourished, as a rule, with simple foods, so that, should an occasion occur when feasting cannot be avoided, no harm results from indulgence. If some high official invites us, or other imperative call come when we are indisposed, it will be boorish to abstain, then to fall into pleuritis or phrenitis through false shame. 123e, 124d. Food and drink are to satisfy hunger and thirst. Dainties should not be consumed merely because they are costly, or because we wish to boast that we have eaten them. The body must not tyrannise over the soul, nor yet the soul over the body, so as to cause overindulgence. A man shall take pride in his power to abstain. Rich, tempting dishes cause us to eat too much. 124e, 126b. Pleasure is impossible without health. We are wont to neglect plain living when we are well, and in sickness to lay the blame upon climate. 
eras, coras, instead of our own intemperance. When ill, we should say to ourselves that drinking cold water, or an untimely bath, has deprived us of many pleasures. In this way, we are made more careful when in health. 126b to 127b. Granted that fevers are caused by exertion, heat and chill, too much food increases the liability. 127b, d. The four warnings given by fever must not be neglected. Some, when they feel an attack coming on, betake themselves to baths and banquets, lest they fall ill before they have satisfied their desires. Others more refined, Comte Sotelloy, are ashamed to show that they are unwell and obey the call of their companions. Most men hope that the feeling of uneasiness will pass off, but on the narrow, they have to confess to catarrh, fever, or colic. Then they will beg the doctor to allow them wine or cold water. All such should remember that the unhealthy body feels no pleasure in the indulgences which cause the trouble. 127d, 128e. The over-strict diet of one, who is always afraid of his health, giving way is certainly to be blamed, as it renders the body liable to fall sick, while it makes the spirit timid and unenterprising. But it is also very unwise to wait for those internal pains which are the forerunners of fever before moderating one's desires and appetites. It is necessary also to be on the watch for bad dreams, crossness of temper or melancholy. Version 28e to 129c. If a man visit a sick friend, inquiry should be made whether it was surfeit, heat, exertion, lack of sleep, or wrong diet that caused his fever. His answers will serve as a guide. One should care for one's own mode of life, avoiding all excesses. 129d to 130c. Reading and discussion are excellent physical training. The mockery of innkeepers or muleteers can be neglected. 130c to 131b. After exercise, cold baths are to be avoided. Those who so indulge fall ill, unless they follow in the smallest details that strict diet which is so undesirable. It is better to oil the body near a fire. 131b d. Meat, dried figs and cooked eggs are not desirable. Vegetables, fowl and light fish are to be the staple food. Milk as a drink should be avoided. Wine in moderation is good, but not as a pick-me-up after exposure. Water should be drunk several times a day. If it be thought a shame to be deprived of food before a fever comes, water may be drunk. 131d to 132f. While eating, a man should exercise his mind with a book or conversation. This will make him less attracted by the pleasures of the table. 133a to 134a. Emetics and purges are bad. Dieting is the proper remedy for indigestion. If something must be done, vomiting is the less evil, but violent drugs must be avoided. Drinking water or fasting for a few days may be tried, or even an injection. Most people take refuge at once in strong purgatives, and suffer for it. 134a to f. On the other hand, a rigid system of fasting is bad. It is so to keep well by ceasing to perform the functions of living. Nay, idleness is not healthy. 135a, 136a. Toil should not be varied by exhausting pleasures. Love of honourable pursuits will drown any desire that is felt for the latter. 136a to e. A man should learn all he can about his own constitution, what suits it and what does not. It is important that care be taken not to tax it at a change of the seasons. 136a to 137b. Students must not tax their bodies by too much study, as many do by worry and exertion at harvest time. Otherwise, they will be compelled to lay aside their books while they are recovering from a fever. 137 C. E. I will, I think, be admitted that, at the period when the treatise it was composed, there was much ill health. The precepts given by the writer himself are strict, and he distinctly states that there were some who imposed upon themselves such rigid rules of life that health was obtained at far too high a cost, or they could not use it without interfering with those prescribed habits which keep them well. The writer does not seem to be referring to infectious sickness, for he nowhere mentions either contagion or infection. Indeed, either ancient Greece 
was singularly free from infectious maladies, other than occasional epidemics, or else the Greeks did not think the danger worth considering. At any rate, isolation of the sick and similar prophylactic measures were not generally recognised. The great danger, according to Plutarch, was fever. The symptoms of fever are not described, but a warning is given not to neglect the premonitory signs, and among these are crossness of temper and melancholy. But the risk of falling ill or fever is said to be greatly increased by certain actions or habits. The causes of fever include 1. Violent fatigue, kopos. 2. Extremities of temperature, especially children's extremities and cold baths at unseasonable times. 3. Overindulgence in food and drink. 4. Insufficiency of rest and sleep. In addition to these definite dangers, the general tone of the treatise implies a strong recommendation to avoid taxing the body or mind by excesses in any form. With the exception of such prophylactic measures as are the direct result of modern discoveries, this advice is just that which is now given to those who dwell in malarious regions. A glance at any medical work dealing with tropical diseases will prove the truth of this statement. But as an example, a sentence may be quoted from a work by Dr. R. Williams. Avoid, he says, exposure to cold, fatigue, improper diet, easily winds, great mental anxiety. It should also be noticed that the change of the seasons is looked upon as an especially dangerous period, and malaria is most common in Greece during the early autumn. Particular attention should be paid to the difficult passage 137c, the general drift of which seems to be that poor country folk constantly fall ill during their exertions at harvest time. Indigestion and constipation were evidently common complaints when the writer lived, as he tells how the people took refuge in violent purgatives. Now, although there are many causes of these stomach complaints, the arrangement of the digestive organs is the invariable accompaniment of malarial cachexia. If any doubt exists as to the kind of fever to which reference is made, the use of phrenitis in 124b should dispel it at once. This word is certainly used to denote a very virulent kind of remitted malaria. It may be concluded with certainty that Greece, or at least Boeotia, in which Plutarch lived, was highly malarious in the first century AD. Hesoid, it may be remembered, does not mention malaria among the plagues of the Boeotian farmer, but Plutarch has a different tale to tell. Attica also is malarious, but perhaps not to such a degree as other districts. Aelus Gilius says that he was attacked by a fever when on a visit to a country house in Attica. Lucian, who travelled much in various parts of Greece and resided for some years in Athens, is an excellent witness to the extent to which fever and all prevailed. It is true that he believed long life could be secured in any climate by proper precautions, but the bare statement of this conviction, when viewed in the light thrown upon the question by other passages, shows how many regions were labouring under the plague of malaria. Fever is held responsible for filling the lower world, and Ipilos, the regular Attic name for Og, figures prominently with consumption, another curse both to ancient and to modern Greece. Before the discovery of quinine, deaths from fever must have been numerous, but as even when not treated with quinine, malaria has not a very high case mortality. The evidence of Lucian shows how universal the disease had become. Indeed, the ancient treatment of malaria could have done but little good, and not unnaturally, faith cures were much in vogue. Fever is chosen as the tropical disease which attacks even kings, and the virulent form of remittent malaria, called phrenitis, is mentioned once. Lucian resembles the other Greek writers in that he often caused malaria by the simple name fever, no further qualification of the word being necessary in a land that is constantly afflicted with the scourge of Paludism. Thus he says that the people of Abdera fall sick of fever and jestingly declares their cause to be their listening to a performance in the heat of summer of a tragedy. This testimony to the highly malarious state of Attica is confirmed by a passage in the letters of Alciparon, the contemporary of Lucian, whom when mention is made of a man attacked by an ague and ended fatally. The sacred discourses of Aelius Aristides do not furnish much evidence. 
there is one explicit reference to a tertian fever, and once or twice symptoms are described which seem to point to malaria, but the details do not permit a positive answer to be given, in spite of the term, paretos. For this word does not always mean malaria, especially when employed by a man familiar with the technical phrases used by physicians. But these discourses imply the existence of a public that would take an interest in detailed descriptions of sickness. Hence illness was probably common, and would not be rash to conclude there was very often malarial disease. The latter writers of the empire help a little towards forming an estimate of the prevalence of malaria. The time when they lived is often uncertain, nor is the district always known to which they refer. But enough evidence exists to make it likely that malaria was never absent. Heliodorus, the novel writer, mentions fever, while Xenophon, another author of the same school, shows how common faith cures and other superstitious methods of treatment must have been. A late Athenian inscription refers to Quartan fever, and a similar one has been found in Euboea, both of these seem to be borrowing the words of the curse in Deuteronomy 28, 22, the Orphic poems, which are of uncertain date, mentioned both Tertians and Quartans, and recommend the use of the agate as a charm, another instance of superstitious treatment that must not be forgotten in estimating the effect of malaria upon the people at large. The history of philosophy compiled by Diogenes Laertius contains a few references to malaria in the quotidians of previous writers. But as it is not always possible to state for certain the dates of the latter, this evidence is not so valuable as it might have been. The apocryphal letters from Pharisees to Thales mention Epilos, and among the Pythagorean dicta, it is stated that autumn and evening are unhealthy. Antisthenes, or been reviled for consorting with wicked men, replied that physicians visit the sick, although they themselves have no fever. An Englishman, accustomed to infectious fevers, is tempted to say that the opponents of Antisthenes meant that he was contaminated by his companions. But this is not so. The Greeks do not look upon fevers as infectious. The implied argument is that birds of a feather flock together. If Antisthenes have base companions, he himself also was base. The philosopher replies by urging that the proverb does not always hold good. Physicians, as he was a physician of souls, visit fever patients, but this does not mean that they are feverish themselves. References to fever are found down to the latest Greek authors. Seetzes mentions it once or twice. In one passage he uses Lithargos, and in another Kafsos, both of which terms slightly remittent or its subcontinuous malaria. It must not be supposed that all the references to Paratos that have been given in this chapter are to be taken in the sense of intermittent or imminent fever. But careful note should be taken of the fact that, where it is possible definitely to state what kind of fever is meant, it is in the most cases malaria. When Demosthenes speaks of the period of a fever, when Aristotle gives fatigue as a cause of fever, he says that the attack is ushered in by shivering, no reasonable doubt can exist as to the malarious nature of the disease. There is in fact scarcely an instance of fever among all the quotations that have just been given which could be diagnosed as certainly non-malarial. This being so, it can be asserted confidently that throughout Greek history, at least after Aristophanes, malaria was so prevalent as to be designated in the common speech by the unqualified term peridos. In conclusion, it may be affirmed, from the evidence of the non-medical literature, that malaria was endemic throughout the greater part of the Greek world by 400 BC. It is very probable that there was a severe outbreak in Attica during the Peloponnesian War, and it is at least likely that disease was common in Magna Graecia and on the coast of Asia Minor as early as 500 BC. But there is only the slightest evidence that malaria existed in the mainland of Greece in early times. The references to Paretos in Homer and to Ipilos in Theotnis are of doubtful meaning. After Aristophanes, however, Paretos in the non-medical literature nearly always means malaria. End of section 3
of Malaria in Greek History by William Henry Samuel Jones and Edward Theodore Withington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 3. Malaria in the Medical Writers Up to the present only, the non-medical writings have been discussed. The difficulty in diagnosing the diseases mentioned in them consists in the vagueness of the nomenclature. Specific names or detailed descriptions are comparatively rare. In interpreting the medical writers, the difficulties encountered are of a different kind. Specific terms are common enough, but they do not always correspond to modern equivalents. The Greek physician classified diseases according to their symptoms. The modern custom is, when possible, to classify them according to the microorganisms that are their primary cause. It is distinctly the exception to find, in the old Greek treatises, that the writer accounts for disease in the same way as a modern scientist would account for it. The doctrines of humours and elements form the framework into which doctors would want to fit their notions of the origins of disease. There are, however, important exceptions. It was well known that marshy districts were unhealthy, and that over fatigue or self-indulgence tended to precipitate an attack of fever. But on the whole, it is true that the historian is not much helped in the task of diagnosis by the so-called causes to which the Greeks trace the origin of disease. Many of the Greek medical writers copied their predecessors without any acknowledgement of the debt. The idea of literary copyright did not then exist. In this manner, there is introduced an element of uncertainty that may easily deceive the unwary. For it to be known that any particular writer borrowed from another, it must not be assumed that the diseases he mentions or describes were common in the district where he lived. It is probable that the history of intermittents in England has been hopelessly confused through the custom of our 16th century physicians who applied the nomenclature of Gallen to English diagnosis in a most unwarrantable fashion. I am unable to satisfy myself of the extent to which malaria existed in England during the Anglo-Saxon period, just because our chief evidence seems to be derived from a translation or adaptation of Greek originals. Fortunately, we have for classical times trustworthy evidence in the Hippocratic corpus, and scepticism does not become justified until we reach the Greco-Roman period. The object of my inquiry is not to discuss fully the multiplicity of forms malaria exhibits in the old medical writings. A treatise of interest to numbered specialists could be written about most of these. It will be sufficient for my present purpose to form a rough estimate of the prevalence of malaria by examining the chief passages which treat of intermittent, remittent, and pernicious fevers, and of malarial cachexia. The works which are included in the Hippocratic corpus were written at various times and by various authors. It has been thought that certain of the writings, the Cohen Prognostics, and the first Prodetic, were compiled from inscriptions on votive offerings in the temple of Aesculapus at Kos. The discoveries made by Cavadius at Epidarius do not afford any support to this view, but nevertheless it is clear that these writings, as well as others of the Corpus, imply a fairly long medical tradition behind them. Hence it is practically certain that malaria was known in the medical schools before Hippocrates, who was born about 460 BC. This conclusion is borne out by the evidence cited in the previous chapter. Still it must be remembered that the disease may have been common enough in Asia Minor, but unknown in Attica and other parts of Greece. The ancient Greeks, keeping themselves secluded in their little city-states, were not very likely to spread infection from one to another. Although it is impossible to fix the date of the earliest Hippocratic writings, for even if Hippocrates wrote out the Cohen prognosis himself, it is probably a, a mere complication. The latest of them appears to have been written before the time of Aristotle. The malarial fevers are mentioned again and again in the Hippocratic collection, so often in fact that a glance over a few pages is enough to convince any reader that they were among the most common diseases with which the Greeks were acquainted. In the first book of the epidemics, fevers are divided into 1. Continuous, Sinaches, 2. Quotidians, 3. Semitergians, Emetretoi, 4. Tertians, Tertoi, 
5. Quartans, Tetratoi, 6. Quintans, Permtatoi, 7. Septans, Evdomoi, and 8. Nonans, Enatidoi. Hippocrates mentions the severity of continuous fevers, which must have included remittent malaria, and rightly remarks that of all fevers, the quartan is at once the longest and the least dangerous. The semi tertian, which was almost certainly the malignant tertian, single or double, is also characterized as being of a particularly fatal nature. The malignant tertian seems to be fully described earlier in the same book, where the writer speaks of a fever which never wholly intermits. But, after the nature of tertians, Trotophia tropon becomes less severe on alternate days. The beginning of the attack is mild, but gradually the fever becomes more severe. There is a slight halt, and then the proxisms become worse than ever. All the distressing symptoms of fever are felt in a specially painful fashion. Hippocrates was familiar with Hippiolos, and in the book on a crisis, mention is made of a curious fever, apparently quotidian, called Lipiria, which turned into Hippiolos and lasted forty days. There is another classification of fevers on the treatise on the nature of man, which according to Aristotle was written by Polybius, the son-in-law of Hippocrates. The division in this case is fourfold. Sinodos, Amphirianos, Tritios, Tertatios. The most interesting remark in the passage is the effect that the age most liable to quartans is from the 25th to the 45th year. Remittent fevers would come under the general head of Sinecius peritoi. But there were certain special forms that were evidently very common in the time of Hippocrates, and were called Kafsos, Phrenetis, and Dithorikos. Much controversy has raged about the meanings of these terms, and although in all probability it would never be possible to solve the whole problem, yet Littre pointed out the way to an approximately correct solution when he insisted that the disease denoted by these three words must be identified not with those prevalent in modern climates, but with those common in Greece at the present day. The burning disease, Kafsos, owed its name to the feeling of intense heat experienced by the patient. Probably no fever is mentioned so frequently in the Hippocratic collection, and it must have been peculiarly prevalent at the time of Hippocrates and afterwards. The symptoms show a remarkable likeness to those of typhoid, and excellent clinicians whom I have consulted on the matter are confident that the disease was, in some cases at least, allied to our enteric. Certainly, if enteric existed, then it would often be called kafsos. But there are many excellent reasons why this term must have included other fevers as well. In the first place, typhoid rarely completes its course as soon as this disease frequently did. Furthermore, kafsos had remissions, and sometimes was the reverse of fatal. Nevertheless, it was accounted an acute disease, and caused directly or indirectly a considerable number of deaths. The conclusion of Littra is that Kafsos is to be identified with remitted and subcontinuous malarial fever. Stephanos agrees, but is well aware how impossible it is to be sure that typhoid must be excluded. There is, however, one difficulty which needs clearing away. Malaria, in Greece at least, is above all things a summer illness, but Hippocrates clearly asserts that Kafsos often occurred in winter. It must not, however, be supposed that this was a universal rule. On the contrary, it is expressly stated in the aphorisms that continuous fevers, kafsoi, tertians and quartans, are diseases of summer. While according to the author of the treatises on affections, the acute diseases occur both in summer and in winter. Less frequently, however, and with less severity in the former case than in the latter. Perhaps the true explanation lies in the fact that the malarial season is not at the same time of the year throughout the whole of Greece, and that in certain places it does not begin before August or September. Thus at Aegean, for Stitza, the beginning is sometimes in September, the height in October, and the decline in February. In Sparta, epidemics may occur from mid-September to November. The most marked characteristics of Phrenetus were pain in the hypochondria, 
particularly in the region of the liver, and delirium. It was an acute disease, and usually ended in death on the third, fifth, or seventh day. The final crisis came on the seventh, or not later than the eleventh day from the beginning of the attack. Gallen, in his contemporaries on Hippocrates' ephemerisms, says that it generally had a tertian periodicity. From the prominent place occupied by it in the Hippocratic collection, it probably was common enough. There are references even in non-medical literature, without altogether excluding typhoid, or the curious mixture of typhoid and malaria called typhoid malaria, to which it bears a remarkable resemblance. We may safely diagnose phrenitis as pernicious malaria of the cerebral or typhoidal type. The characteristic of lethargos was irresistible coma. It was generally fatal, occurred chiefly in winter, and attacked adults. Here, perhaps, a covenant diagnosis would be unwise, but the disease bears a strong likeness to the comatose form of pernicious malaria. It is most uncertain whether black water fever is referred to in the ancient medical writings. A theory is at present much in vogue that traces its origin, at least in many cases, to the use of quinine, with which the Greeks were certainly unfamiliar. Black urine, Melana Ora, is mentioned several times by Hippocrates. But one of our best authorities on the disease assures me that the cases described in the first book of the epidemics cannot be black water fever. Stephanos, who gives an excellent summary of the history of the disease in Greece, would not commit himself to a definite statement whether or not it was known to Hippocrates. But if there is doubt about the early existence of black water fever, it is quite certain that Hippocrates was perfectly familiar with malarial cachexia. Nothing could be clearer than the full and repeated descriptions to be found in the treatise Airs, Waters, Places. So large a part of the book is taken up by accounts of this miserable condition that the reader is forced to conclude that as early as 400 BC, a large part of Greece was highly malarious. There is a passage in the treatise on affections, where bilious sufferers from large spleens are said to be evil-complexioned, ulcerous and emaciated. Their breath is foul, and they are the victims of constipation. This is an excellent description of malarial cachexia, and with it should be compared the account in airs, waters, placers, of those who drink the water of marshy districts. They are said to have large spleens, but thin faces and shoulders. Dropsies of a fatal character are common. In summer occur dysentery, diarrhea, long quartans, and then dropsy. In winter the younger people suffer from perinevomnia and maniodia nosvata. The older men from kafsoi. The birth rate is affected by the physical condition of the women. The inhabitants are short-lived. Towards the end of the same work, there is a description of those who dwell in low, meadowy, limacodia, and hot districts, where winds and waters are warm. These people are said to be neither tall nor well-built, but stout, fleshy, dark-haired, dark-coloured, and bilious. By nature, for see, they are neither courageous nor of great powers of endurance, although good institutions, nomos, may produce these virtues in them. Not only is this passage a faithful portrait of malarial cachexia, but it also shows that acute observers were well aware, even in the time of Hippocrates, of the evil effects of malaria upon the character of those who were continually exposed to its influence. The inference to be drawn from the Hippocratic collection is that the Greeks of 400 BC were perfectly familiar with intermittent fevers, remittent fevers, various pernicious types of malaria, and malarial cachexia. Of Alcameon, and the other predecessors of Hippocrates, practically nothing is known. But of his successors, Diocles of Caristus, 350 BC, Praxagoras of Cos, 335 BC, and many other famous physicians belonging to the various schools, are sometimes referred to in the works of later writers. Diocles was the author of a work on fevers. His definition of fevers recorded by Gallen, and he seems to have denied the existence of fevers having a longer periodicity than the quartan. Braxagoras knew Epiolos and declared that certain fevers were more fatal when the patient was between the ages of 12 and 17. A liberal diet of flesh and wine was prescribed for sufferers from fever by Petronus of Agena, and 
Heraclides of Tarentum, 230 BC, was much praised for his treatment of Phrenetus. The Greek physicians who came to Rome paid great attention to Phrenetus and Lithargos. Acathenus of Lacedaemon, 90 AD, wrote a special treatise on semi-tertians, while Archigenes of Apamia, an able physician as well as surgeon, not only was familiar with the semi-tertian, but also wrote ten books on fevers. Of the work of Areteus, a physician who stood apart from the medical controversies of this period, a considerable portion is still extant. He wrote in Ionic Greek, and is famous for his graphic descriptions of disease, which perhaps excel even those of hypocrites. He tells us that splint diseases are rife in marshy countries, and that children are most subject to them. There is also a long passage dealing with the treatment of Phrenetus and Lithargos, while his visited accounts of Cassos has always been greatly admired. The compiler Strabaeus has preserved for us several excerpts from the work of Antillus, who wrote, among other things, treatises on hygiene, the character of different errors, and the like. It is plain enough that the writer lived when malaria was universal and in some places severe. He states roundly that the late afternoon is unhealthy, like autumn, and so is the early part of the night. The unhealthiness of autumn must surely refer to malaria, and the evening is a dangerous time in malarious countries because it is then that the mosquitoes come out from their hiding places and bite. In another passage it is said that a high elevation increases healthiness, but marshy districts are always unhealthy, and in summer, pestilential. The special treatises on fevers, and on particular kinds of fever, which were written between the date of the Hippocratic collection and that of Galen, are typical of the tendency in Greek medicine to favour the minute subdivision of diseases. Galen, who practised at Rome, and is therefore not a very trustworthy authority for Greek malaria, distinguishes carefully between continuous and subcontinuous fevers, and his account of the intermittence is marked by desire to classify them according to the presence or absence of all the symptoms. So we have exquisite tertians and bastard tertians. Mixed and double infections are clearly recognised, and a most excellent description is given of a malarial attack. It is unfortunate that so copious a writer does not throw much light upon malaria in Greece. But it is to Galen that we owe our knowledge of many of his predecessors. Possibly the most interesting information he gives is that quotidians usually attack very young children. Tertians, young men, and semi-tertians, which we are told were common in Rome, men in their prime of life. The influence of Galen is very noticeable in his successors, Orobasius of Pergamus, the friend of the Emperor Julian, Hetius of Amidia, who was a count at the Byzantine court in the 6th century, Alexander of Trails, the contemporary of Hetius, Paulus of Aegina, a physician of the next century, and Palladius, who has left a treatise on fevers. Full and classified descriptions of malarial fevers occupy a prominent position in the works of these writers but it's quite impossible to say how far their lengthy accounts are due to the prevalence of malaria, how far to their habit of copying, and how far to mere spinning of theory. End of section 4。section 5 of Malaria in Greek History by William Henry Samuel Jones and Edward Theodore Withington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 5. The Extent to Which Malaria Prevailed It is unfortunately impossible to assert positively that malaria was unknown in Greece during the early period. The argument from silence is proverbially dangerous, but it is at least remarkable that the ancients themselves threw doubt upon the meaning of the Homeric reference to Paretos, while some of the best scholars hold that the word Epilos, as used by Theognes, means nightmare, not Aug. On the other hand, excellent authorities have been at a loss to reconcile with the presence of severe endemic malaria, the high state of civilization which is known to have existed. On the whole, it is safe to assert that the disease could not have been prevalent to any great extent. 
With regard to Attica, the evidence appears to be a little more conclusive. In the first place, there is a curious prominence of fever, with special mention of Epilos in the wasps of Aristophanes. Secondly, the introduction of the cult of Asclepius, 420 BC, implies that ill health was common. Finally, the Decilian War, by preventing the cultivation of the soil, offered most favourable conditions to the malaria mosquito. It is quite certain that this war would greatly increase the amount of malaria in the district, if it existed at all before. If, on the other hand, the disease was absent from Attica before the last quarter of the 5th century, it would, on its introduction, spread with great rapidity, owing to the neglect of irrigation and agriculture during the Peloponnesian War. In either case, when Attica was or was not malarious during the period before his struggle with Sparta, the frequent mention of malaria in the plays of Aristophanes is certainly accounted for by the condition of Attica at the time. There is no a priori difficulty involved in the supposition that Attica was non-malarious, or comparatively so, even as late as 430 BC. It is now known that two factors, mosquitoes and infected persons, are necessary before the disease can spread, so that the inquirer is no longer in the difficulty of Maculoc, who seems to have been only too eager to admit that Rome in her day of greatness was not malarious, but was yet forced to take the other view, just because he was convinced that where marshes are, their malaria must abound. But if anopheline mosquitoes were few in number, and the malaria patients entering the country from malarious regions escaped being bitten, the disease would not get a firm grip upon Attica until favourable conditions were offered to the mosquito. Then especially if the number of malaria patients coming in from abroad increased, as they probably would do in more time, a malaria epidemic would be a certainty, and once epidemic, the disease usually becomes endemic. Even during the last few years, according to observers on the spot, malaria seems to have increased in certain parts of Attica. The present fearful state of Marathon is said by Dr. A.K. Anastopoulos to be due to the railway running into Boucher. Increased faculty of communication has, according to this authority, caused malaria patients from Boucher to be bitten by the mosquitoes in the Marathonian marshes. Whether this explanation be true or false, it is at least certain that malaria has much increased in this district even within the memory of man. It seems probable enough that when once the disease established itself in ancient Greece, it raged severely. Many facts at any rate point in this direction. In spite of the woods that in classical times were growing on the mountain sides, torrents, charadri, chemarori, were common enough and these, by partially drying up in summer, would form little pools and so spread malaria, as they do to this day. The Greeks had a special name, Telma, for land which, being low, became a marsh after heavy rain. Swamps of this sort breed mosquitoes very rapidly, and the references show how common they were. Istromachus, in explaining to Socrates a good way to enrich the land, says, Heaven supplies water, all the low places become swamps, telmata, and the earth supplies all kinds of growth. He who is going to sow must clear the land. If he throw into the water the refuse, the mere lapse of time will turn it presently into that in which the land delights. For what growth, what earth does not, when the stagnant water becomes manure? This single passage is enough to show that ancient Greece fulfilled the conditions required for the rapid development of malaria although the method recommended in the Oeconomicus would, no doubt, lessen the danger to a certain extent. Strabo's description of Boeotia forces the reader to conclude that malaria would spread there with great rapidity and to a high degree of severity, an examination of the context where Greek writers used the words elos, tiphos, and their derivatives afford additional proof of the extent to which the country could harbour the mosquito. The immediate neighbourhood of Athens was probably more marshy in ancient times than it is now, besides the bed of the Elysis, which then as now was often a series of shallow pools. There were swamps in the neighbourhood of the Piraeus and Philirim, and small marshes near the Lyceum and 
Ceramicus, in the district called Limne, and on the side of the stadium. The Cephesus, in all probability, bred hosts of mosquitoes at the proper season, and it is just possible that the sacred olives, morae, sequoi, which were preserved so carefully, even when they had become old and rotten, helped to increase the number of the insects. Athens itself was very muddy in wet weather, and it is clear from a passage in the wasps, where the old men who form the chorus are represented as much troubled by the mud in the streets. Of course, it is not likely that larvae of anophelines would have been found in the streets of Athens, but the muddy states of these streets shows that suitable puddles must have existed in suitable places. Aristotle says in his Natural History that larvae were often to be found in muddy cisterns, friata, and other places where there was a sediment of earth. This in all probability refers to Chironomus, but the Athenian method of storing water may well have helped to spread malaria. I cannot identify with anephalines any of the insects mentioned in Greek writings, but the Athenians were sadly plagued by mosquitoes and other insects. By the most common cogent testimony to the rapidity with which malaria must have spread is to be found in the absence of prophylactic measures and the lack of adequate means of treatment. While the Greeks knew that marshes were dangerous, they do not appear to have been in the least aware of the part played by the mosquito. Herodotus mentions, apparently as a curiosity, the habit of the Egyptian marsh dwellers, who at night wrap themselves in their fishing nets in order to avoid the bite of the insect, while the word for mosquito net, konopion, konopion, seems to be of quite late origin. Some of the Greek customs were calculated to a little to increase disease. The Greeks carried on their wars in the warm months. The Olympic Games were held in the middle of summer, that is, in the height of the malaria season, and also in a district liable because of the river Alpheus to become malarious. The enormous crowds that gathered together on such occasions from all quarters of the Greek world could scarcely fail to become badly infected. It is quite impossible adequately to fight malaria without quinine. In Italy, its sale is regulated by law, and the Greek Anti-Malaria League is striving hard to secure for Greece a constant supply of the drug, and to see that it be cheap and pure. Stephanos says that the Greek peasant values quinine as highly as he does bread. Physicians have noticed that since the use of quinine has become more common, malaria has diminished, not only in extent, but in severity. In ancient Greece, of course, quinine was unknown, and the disease must have run its course unchecked by any really efficacious remedy. It should be observed that quinine not only relieves the patient, but also by killing the parasites in his blood, prevents the mosquito from carrying the infection from him to healthy persons. End of section 5《セクション6 of Malaria in Greek History》by William Henry Samuel Jones and Edward Theodore Withington。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 5: The Effects of Malaria. History contains many instances, far too numerous to discuss here, of disasters in war caused by malarial disease. In this respect, there is but little difference between the effects of malaria and those of enteric, typhus, plague, and smallpox, all of which have again and again proved far more deadly than the weapons of human foes. The peculiar and distinctive characteristics of malaria are not to be looked for in these sudden and violent catastrophes. Owing to the manner in which it is propagated, it tends to fasten itself upon certain districts, and once there, generally speaking, it remains forever. Of course, there are exceptions. Erg gradually disappeared from England as the marshy parts were drained, and the application of the results of scientific research has diminished considerably the amount and severity of the disease in Italy and elsewhere. This being so, malarious regions gradually lose many of their inhabitants, not only by death but also by emigration. Examples are Salogne in France, the Campagna, and many parts of India. Those who leave the country to seek healthier homes are mostly the rich and the intelligent, and so at length there remains but a residue of the poor, the stupid, and the unenterprising. 
Left to themselves, these wretched inhabitants sink into still greater degradation, for they are without any to ameliorate their lot by example, precept, or active help. The moral sense of the natives of these towns, says North, is so degraded that the death of a horse or mule is said to be a matter of far greater concern to them than that of a child or relative. Williams quotes the experience of Bishop Heber, who says a whole skirt or margin of the mountains, the Himalayas, from the Royal Kund country, is surrounded by a thick forest of nearly two days' journey, with a marshy soil and atmosphere during two-thirds of the year, more pestilential than the Sunderbuns or the Grotto del Cane. The villages also, through which he passed, he says, were singularly wretched, though there is no want of building materials, and the rate of land is very low. It seems, however, as if the annual oak took away all energy from the inhabitants, who are a very ugly and miserable race of human beings, with large heads and particularly prominent ears, flat noses, tumid bellies, slender limbs, and sallow complexions. The inhabitants of the Roman Campagna are scarcely less wretched. This emigration from unhealthy to healthy districts certainly occurred in ancient Greece, although it must be admitted that there is little positive evidence to be brought forward. The Croyopedia proves that the salubrity or the insalubrity of sites was a constant theme for discussion, and such debates must have had more than a theoretical interest. Some of the emigrants of the 3rd century BC found their way to Alexandria, although it was doubtless the disturbed state of the country and the decline of agriculture that led many Greeks to leave their homes, yet it is surely more than a mere coincidence that Strabo notices with surprise the healthiness of Alexandria, in spite of its apparently dangerous situation. The degradation of those who inhabit malarious places was carefully recorded by Hippocrates. He states that those who live in low, moist, hot districts and drink the stagnant water of necessity suffer from a large spleen. They are stunted and ill-shaped, fleshy and dark, bilious rather than phlegmatic. Their nature is to be cowardly and averse from hardship, but good discipline can improve their character in this respect. This remarkable account is, so far as I know, unique in Greek literature, but it is a certain proof that the Greeks were well aware of the deleterious effect of malaria. So apathetic do those become who reside in unhealthy regions, that it is often observed how careless of their own improvement they seem to be. It is a characteristic moral feature, says Maclock, of those who reside in such unhealthy situations in France, and a fact noticed by every one who has examined these districts to deny strenuously the existence of danger, and to maintain that neither the soil which they inhabit, nor the air which they die rather than live, nor their modes of life or labour, are unwholesome. I have found no expression of this apathy among the ancient Greeks, but it may be that references to the serious consequences of malaria would be more numerous if the very presence of the disease had not blinded the eyes of those who lived under its influence. Malarious regions are generally extremely fertile. The moisture which favours the growth of the mosquito at the same time renders the soil suitable for agriculture. The increase in malaria is an economic calamity which robs the country of its most precious source of wealth. So tempting is the chance to become rich that many come from more healthy quarters and, with their lives in their hands, endeavour to reclaim the land which has been abandoned by their predecessors. This is true of modern Greece, and two hundred years ago it was true also of England. Defoe, when passing through Essex in 1722, observed that not one half of the inhabitants are natives of the place, but such as from other countries or other parts of this country settle here for the advantage of good farms, for which I appeal to any impartial inquiry, having myself examined to it critically in several places. But in spite of these often repeated attempts, rarely permanently successful without the help of modern science, to work profitably on malarious sites, the economic loss is enormous. Silly, sums up briefly and to the point. Malaria annually costs Italy incalculable treasure. So great are the damage and the moral degeneration caused by the disease that many have been at a loss to account for the splendour and full development of the ancient civilizations. Special attention has been paid to the state of Italy during the flourishing period in the history of Rome. Maclock, after a very fair inquiry, can come to no definite conclusion. 
he is content with pointing out how puzzling a problem it is, although the only reason why he refused to believe that ancient Italy was less malarious than it is now in his conviction that where marshes are, there, there must be malaria, a generalization which is now known to be too sweeping. Brocchi held that the ancient Romans were as subject to unhealthy influences as are the modern inhabitants of Italy, but were saved from the worst effects by the use of their thick woolen toga. As wool gave way to linen and silk, so did the fever increase. North boldly declares that it is inconceivable that a civilized and powerful people, such as the ancient Etruscans undoubtedly were, should have established themselves and built great cities in a country so fever-stricken as the northern parts of the province of Rome and the Tuscan Harema now are. And again he writes, What do we know is that their prosperity and civilization were quite incompatible with a presence among them in any grave form of such an enemy to progress and prosperity as malaria. The inference drawn by North is that malaria increased as prosperity declined, being the result and not the cause of the decay of civilization. The point upon which I would lay stress is the difficulty felt by acute observers of believing that malaria has not increased since the classical period, and this difficulty is not a whit the less in the case of Greece. If the Greeks of the Great Period were highly malarious, they were a truly marvellous people. Stephanos believes that malaria has much increased since the Middle Ages, and is very positive as to the mischief it causes. Further, he refused to admit that there were great endemic foci in the majority of Greek districts during classical times. As a rule, towns are less malarious than the country, so that the urban population tends to absorb the agricultural class. In consequence, national physique and well-being suffer, but in ancient Greece, there were no causes at work which, at least in part, neutralized this tendency. In the first place, several parts of the country remained comparatively healthy, and migration took place to these as well as to the towns. Besides this, there are strong reasons for believing that the old Greek cities were not so free from malaria as might be supposed. The modes of storing water and the muddy state of the roads in wet weather show that conditions in towns were not uncomfortable to the growth of the malaria mosquito. A parallel is to be seen in ancient Rome, which, in the imperial times, was so unhealthy that all who could afford it migrated in summer to their country villas. Even if the Greeks did migrate more and more into their towns as malaria increased, it would be impossible to say how far this was due to other causes, such as the civil wars which distressed the country right up to the period of Roman suzerainty. Personally, I am of opinion that the influence of malaria was strong, but it cannot, I think, be proved. One of the most serious consequences of malaria is its effect upon the young. In the worst districts, every child is affected, and partial immunity, which is the most that can be hoped for, does not come before the age of puberty. The untrained eye frequently fails to diagnose the disease, owing to the less marked form it assumes in a young patient, and to this perhaps is due the comparative silence of the ancient authors on this important question. Malaria often causes convulsions, when it occurs in children, and from the many references to this symptom as characteristic of infantile disease. It is plain, although it might well have been assumed, that the sufferings of the little ones of Greece helped to swell the amount of pain and misery that malaria inflicted. Modern Greece offers an instructive parallel. Major Ross examined the children of Molki, a small village on the Copaic Plain, and his accounts explain how malaria affects the well-being of a nation by making unhealthy the lives of the young. The scene, he says, was most interesting. Seated on a large tree with a village priest as our patron and protector, we pricked and palpated the little ones, one by one. I never saw pluckier children. Scarcely one of them even winced at the vivisection. Nearly all of them were very intelligent and many good-looking, but alas, most of them were far from well, and some looked miserably ill, emaciated, and anemic. The cause was speedily revealed. Out of sixty-two of the children, between the ages of five months and fourteen years, no less than thirty-five were found to have enlarged spleens. Hence, out of a total of sixty-two children, no less than forty were certainly infected, a ratio of them of 64.5%. It is easy to see how a child, 
whose early years are marked by a succession of weakening attacks of fever, will probably enter adult life with a debilitated constitution and an ill-educated mind. Ancient literature, however, has not preserved much definite information about the physical condition of the young. The clearest light is thrown upon the question by the declaration of the Roman poet Martial. In the summer, boys learn enough if they keep well. It has been pointed out that the Greeks were quite conscious how great is the danger from chill and overexertion in a malarious country. Aristotle states bluntly that fatigue is the cause of fever, while the Plutarchian treatise on the preservation of health is one continued protest against exhausting the body by excess or chill. The dwellers in malarious regions, consciously or unconsciously recognizing the peril, tend to avoid toil, either of body or of mind. It would be so violent that an attack of fever may be expected to follow. In time, the impulse becomes stereotyped as a habit, and so partially for the reason given here, and partially because the energetic emigrate to healthier homes. Laziness and lack of enterprise are marked characteristics of these unfortunate people. Each generation, as it is born, is subjugated, not only by the same physical surroundings as were its parents, but also to an unhealthy moral atmosphere. The evil results of such a condition have often been observed by physicians and others. The natives of India, says Martin, of the higher classes, avoid all exertion during the rainy season, while the working classes, at all seasons, are sparing of extra labour, and when compatible with the work in hand, sitting is ever the posture of the artesian in the East. There is in hot climates, it has been well observed, a vis inertiae which indisposes men to change their customs or to cope with abuses, and the indolence which the climate occasions conduces to the stability of their barbarous institutions. Englishmen have noticed the evil mental conditions which they have themselves experienced as a result of tropical fevers. Beach dukes, who took part in the surveying voyage of HMS Fly, traces to these diseases the inertness, indolence, and indifference to anything beyond the comfort of the passing hour. They want of energy and action so almost universally characteristic of the resident in hot climates. Very similar is the opinion of Ramsay, who appeals to all who have experience whether this is not a singularly apt description of that fever, which has such an annoying and tormenting habit of catching one by the heel just at the most inconvenient moments, in the midst of some great effort and on the eve of some serious crisis, when all one's energies are specially needed. Stephanos admits that, although the modern Greeks are, are one of the most hard-working races of South Europe, it is hopeless to expect to find activity in the malarious districts. The quotation given above from the Aeos, Waters and Places of Hippocrates shows that the ancient Greeks also perceived the want of energy which characterizes those who live in unhealthy regions. The malign consequences of malaria include, as Hippocrates says, not only laziness but cowardice. The coward is proverbially cruel, and so the history of a malarious country will probably be marked by fitful efforts begun under the influence of excitement, pursued with no constancy or vigour, and often strained by perfidy, deceit, blind folly and savage cruelty. But other causes may bring about these moral faults. And though the Alexandrian period of Greek history illustrates the bad qualities developed by malaria, and that to a quite remarkable extent, it is perhaps unsafe to assert confidently that malaria was the primary cause. Nevertheless, the evidence of Polybius, throwing light as it does, upon the character of the Greeks during the century that preceded the Roman conquest, deserves careful consideration. He is a sharp critic of the Greek statesmen, pointing to their selfishness and lack of good faith. Brutality is said to have been particularly rife among the people of Senethia, and Polybius traces it to neglect of music and to climatic influences. Although disease is not specially mentioned, so that it is perhaps a mere coincidence that the modern Calavirtia and its neighbourhood are very malarious. The Boeotians underwent a complete change of character after Lyctra. They lost ambition and cared for nothing but pleasure, becoming effeminate in soul as well as in body. Here again, it may be nothing more than an accident that Boeotia is, and perhaps always has been, one of the most malarious districts in the country. 
the Greeks in general displayed want of good faith and want of courage. Madness and ferocity were infecting everybody. The whole country seemed to be under an evil spell, such as Polybius' account of the condition of affairs just before the final triumph of Rome. And he states that the worst points in the Greek character were love of pleasure and aversion from toil. Even Mahaffey, although by no means apt to give Polybius more credit for historical accuracy than he deserves, agrees with the general picture that is drawn of the decay of Greek morality, and adds cruelty to the list of vices with which the decadent Greeks may justly be charged. The evidence of Polybius bears very closely upon another point, the rapid depopulation of Greece during the 2nd century BC. This may have been due partially to the emigration from the country, which was continually going on, while in its turn the emigration may have been caused by malaria. Farming became dangerous, men's activities were directed towards commerce, which was greatly encouraged by the opening up of the East. But did malaria kill many people? In all probability it did, but not to such an extent as greatly to reduce the population. Polybius expressly states that serious pestilences did not occur at the time of which he is speaking, and lays the blame of depopulation upon the selfishness of the Greeks, who had been addicted to pleasure if they did not marry at all, or refused to rear more than one or two children, lest it should be impossible to bring them up in extravagant luxury. The next sentence of the writer warns us that we must not take the remark about the absence of disease in the strictest sense, for he goes on to say that when there are but one or two sons, the death of one by war or pestilence is a serious matter. In fact, deaths from malaria might be neglected in a full population, but when the rising generation is limited, malaria or any other disease becomes the most dangerous menace. In modern Greece, deaths from malaria are comparatively few being about one in every 176 cases, but two considerations have to be remembered before making any calculations as to the number of deaths caused by malaria in ancient Greece. Modern methods of treatment have greatly reduced the severity of the attack and the chances of a fatal issue. In Greece, many victims had recourse, not to medicine, but to some form of magic or priestcraft, and even the physicians were without the great specific for malaria, quinine. In the second place, although malaria may not be the direct cause of many deaths, indirectly it is more serious. It may safely be concluded that malaria killed many people, but the number would not have been enough permanently to reduce the population had not other factors been in active operation. Be this as it may, it cannot be doubted that malaria greatly diminished the average length of human life. The writer of the Suedo Aristotelian Problems expressly states that those who live in low, marshy districts age rapidly. When to the above have been added the loss of time and waste of energy, in the case of both patient and nurse, which are caused by endemic malaria, the physical and material damage has been perhaps fully described. There yet remains a problem, obscure but intensely interesting, of the direct influence of malaria upon character. That disease and climate affect the moral life was noticed by Montesquieu. Cabanus, who made a careful study of the relations existing between the physical and moral sides of human life, discusses, in particular, the consequences of consumption and the intermittent fevers. It is in patients suffering from th these diseases that the moral change is easiest to perceive. The general question of the effect of illness upon character was a familiar one in the time of Herodotus, and Theophrastus seem to have paid its special attention. But it is in Plato that the most pertinent evidence can be found. He declares that the humours of acid and salt phlegms, and such as are bitter and bilious, when no outlet for them from the body can be found, befog the soul and produce manifold vices. Peevishness, melancholy, rashness, cowardice, forgetfulness and stupidity. Plato evidently has in mind some catsexia, rather than an acute disease, and as he must have known malarial cachexia well, it is probably the disease state referred to by him. Accordingly, besides hypocrites, Plato may perhaps be taken as witness to the evil effects of malaria upon character. Before proceeding, it will be well briefly to consider what the Greeks meant by melancholy. The question is extremely complicated not only because the ancient classification of diseases by symptoms gives rise to perplexing ambiguities, 
but also because of the connection of the term with the doctrine of the humours. Gallen defines melancholy as an affection without fever that injures the mind and is accompanied by a profound depression and aversion from the things the patient loves best. In some cases, excess of black bile injures the stomach so that vomiting occurs and consequent harm is done to the mind. The treatise on melancholy, printed by Kuhn in the 19th volume of his edition of Callan, contains a fairly complete account of the disease. The hypochondria are often affected first. Indigestion, vomiting and foul breath are noticeable symptoms, while the sleeplessness, fear and depression are some of the mental derangements of the patient. The greatest diversity is to be found. Some fear death, others commit suicide. Some shun the light, others darkness. The disease may be either constitual or acquired by an unhealthy mode of living. Gallen also states that it is commonly occurred in adults rather than in the young. In the Hippocratic Corpus, the disease is mentioned several times, and in particular it is brought into connection with symptoms of apoplexy and delirium. At the end of the sixth book of the Epidemics, an intimate relation is pointed out between melancholy and epilepsy. Enough has been said to show that the disease may generally be identified with melancholia, the causes of which are sometimes mental and sometimes physical, such as debilitating illness or declining strength. All the symptoms mentioned above, the depression, derangements of the digestive organs, delusions, lack of sleep, offensive breath, can be seen in the case of modern patients, and besides the milder form, there is also acute melancholia when the patients, instead of being depressed, are panic-stricken, and violent frenzy behave like madmen, tearing off their clothes and trying to escape from those about them. But there are other points to be considered. Hippocrates, in a famous passage of the Aphorisms, says that melancholia, as it may now be called, was most common in spring and in autumn, that is, at the beginning and at the height of the malarial season. Again, melancholia is evidently the disease caused by black bile, to which the Greek doctors attributed quartan fevers. In the popular speech, the words melancholia, melancholio, melancholikos denote that a man is crazy or neurotic, and occur for the first time very soon after the terms pyretos, pyrezo, become common. Finally, Galen holds that large spleens, a sure sign of continued malaria, are caused by excess of the melancholy humour. Three facts need to be taken into account in drawing our conclusion. 1. Melancholia is very often the result of physical debility. 2. There is a marked tendency of malaria to cause anemia. 3. There is a connection, in the Greek medical writers, between melancholia, on the one hand, and autumn, big spleens, and the supposed origin of quartans on the other. Sometimes, doubtless, melancholy was not our melancholia. Many causes, likewise, must have brought about true melancholia among the Greeks. But it seems impossible to avoid the inference that malaria was the chief source of disease. This being so, the Greeks were acute enough to see that malaria may, directly or indirectly, produce a change of character, and this conviction found expression in the common use of melancholia, and its cognates to devote crazy or nervous conduct. Nor is this all. The importance attached to melancholia in the medical writers, and the fact that it gave a new word to the popular speech, proved that it was of frequent occurrence. Cabanus calls particular attention to this. A large number of the inhabitants were afflicted with this strange disorder, which is one no less destructive to the mental faculties than to the body. The exact proportion of the population affected, it is of course impossible to ascertain, as the ancients have left us no statistics on the point. But there can be no doubt that there were enough sufferers from melancholia and malarial debility to form a serious hindrance to healthy social life. Even those who were sound must have been the worst for coming up into daily contact with persons of unhealthy mind. To us, perhaps, the danger does not appear grave, but account has to be taken of the peculiar features of Greek life. The greatness of the Greek character depend, in no slight degree, upon the constant intercourse of a comparatively small number of men, who met to discuss and transact the business of a city-state. But if a small proportion suffered at one time from the consequences of malaria, in the course of a generation the number would be enough greatly to weaken the mental life of the whole community.
the mischievous effect upon the children can scarcely be exaggerated. Those whose parents were victims could rarely fail to copy the characteristics of their elders, to form habits of indecision, and to sink into pessimism, moroseness, ferocity, and other forms of psychic weakness. It is surely not fanciful to trace to this source the subtle but unmistakable change which came over the Greek character after the fifth, and to a great degree after the fourth century before Christ. Gradually the Greeks lost their brilliance, which had been as the bright freshness of healthy youth. This is painfully obvious in their literature, if not in other forms of art. Their initiative vanished, they ceased to create and began to comment. Patriotism, with rare exemptions, became an empty name, for few had the high spirit and energy to translate into action man's duty to the state. Vacillation, indecision, fitful outbursts of unhealthy activity, followed by cowardly depression, selfish cruelty, and criminal weakness, are the characteristics of the public life of Greece, from the struggle with Macedonia to the final conquest by the arms of Rome. No one can fail to be struck by the marked difference between the period from Marathon to the Peloponnesian War, and the period from Alexander to Momius. Philosophy also suffered and became deeply pessimistic, even in the hands of its best and noblest exponents. Absence of feeling, absence of care, such were the highest goals of human endeavour. How far this change was due to other causes is a complicated question. The population may have suffered from foreign admixture during the troubled times that followed the death of Alexander. There are, however, many reasons against the view that these disturbances produced any appreciable difference on race. The presence of vast numbers of slaves, not members of households, but the gangs of toilers whom the increase of commerce brought to the country, pandered to a foolish pride that looked upon many kinds of honourable labour as being shameful and unbecoming to a free man. The very institution that made Greek civilization possible encouraged idleness, luxury, and still worse vices. A natural vice, which in some states seems to have been positively encouraged, was prevalent among the Greeks to an almost incredible extent. It is hard not to believe that much physical harm was caused thereby, of the loss to moral strength and vigour, there is no need to speak. The city-state again, however favourable to the development of public spirit and a sense of responsibility, was doomed to fail in a struggle against the stronger powers of Macedon and Rome. The growth of the scientific spirit destroyed the old religion. The more intellectual tried to find principles of conduct and philosophy, the ignorant or half-educated. Deprived of the strong moral support that always comes from sharing the convictions of those abler and wiser than oneself, fell back upon degrading superstitions. In either case, there was a serious loss of that spirit of self-sacrifice and devotion which a vigorous religious faith alone can bestow. Without such a spirit, as history proves inconclusively, no national people can survive. Finally, the commercial position of the country declined with the development of direct communication between East and West. Alexandria and Rhodes soon occupied the position once held by Corinth and Athens. With all these forces in operation, it may be said that there is no need to drag in malaria nor to explain the decline of the Greek nation. This criticism, specious as it may appear, is in reality unsound. Surely it is pertinent to reply that a vigorous people will bravely cast aside worn-out institutions and adopt others, will not yield to vicious habits, but overcome them, will not calmly look on while others succeed in their place, but make a desperate effort to assert themselves. The presence of an endemic disease, weakening each generation as it was born, and unchecked by prophylaxis or antidote, gave free scope for action to other disintegrating forces and made recovery impossible. Colin, in his master description of the decay of Greece, brings out very well the fact that even in the great period it is possible to discern traces of those flaws which afterwards proved the ruin of the race. No time were the evils of faction and of want of unity unfelt. Barbarity can be seen in the history of tyranny and the Peloponnesian War, as well as in the pages of Polybius. Want of good faith has its prototype in Odysseus, of many wiles, that of Athenians were lovers of words rather than deeds struck Cleon, no less perhaps than the Romans. It is, I think, reasonable to see in malaria one factor, out of probably many others, 
that caused these harmful tendencies to develop to such a dangerous extent. Athens shared in the decline as much as any other Greek state. The depth to which her people had sunk is illustrated by the famous ode of Duius addressed to Demetrius. The Epicurean philosophy is typical of the general state of morals prevalent during the 3rd century. Yet the more refined became Epicureans, the common people degenerated into mere pleasure seekers, ready to submit to any external tyranny, provided that their ease and comfort remained unimpaired. If the new comedy can be trusted to give a faithful copy of temporary life, the Athenians had grown frivolous, luxurious, and strangely wanting in moral principle. This disastrous change is all the more striking because of the lofty position previously held by Athens. No other state had displayed the characteristic Greek virtues to such a high degree. So marked a change implies a special cause, and this is probably to be found in the Peloponnesian War. For a generation, the Athenians were engaged in war with their fellow Greeks. Attica was continually laid waste, and after the Lacedaemonians established themselves at Decilia, cultivation of the soil of necessity came practically to a standstill. The prick of the young manhood fell in battle, the failure of one enterprise only. The Sicilian expedition must have reduced seriously the population of a city that guarded citizenship so strictly that losses could be made good only by its own productiveness. During the whole war, Athens lived in a state of alarm and excitement that could not fail to exercise an evil influence on the rising generation, even before it was born. Soon after the war began came the plague, at a time when practically the whole population of Attica was penned up in Athens, the Prius and the space between the long walls. Whatever its nature, it was a fatal disease, and spared not even the strongest. Indeed, there is some reason for believing that virulent infections attack, by preference, the soundest constitutions. In addition to this, we have evidence, in my mind overwhelming, that malaria, although possibly present before, became endemic in Attica at a time when neglect of cultivation and drainage offered favourable conditions for the growth for the mosquito. Such a conjuration of misfortunes must have proved peculiarly disastrous to a people who refused to recuperate lost strength by admitting immigrants as citizens. Athens received a shock from which recovery, in the circumstances, was impossible. What is the view taken of the Athenians of the 4th century BC, whether it be Droysden or Holm, that comes nearer to the truth? No one will doubt that under the Roman dominion, the general character of the Greek race was no longer what it had been in the glorious days of the past. It will be a simple task to show how the imperfections of the latter Greeks, the decline of physical excellence, the lack of mental and moral strength, even the depopulation of the country can be accounted for by the wide prevalence of malaria. But such a line of reasoning would be fallacious in the extreme. Malaria, no doubt, was operating through the whole period and producing its inevitable consequences. In particular, by exacting a heavy penalty from those who subjected themselves to strain or fatigue, it created habits of laziness and indifference. But malaria was not the only factor in the change. It was but one of the many causes, a single component of a more complex whole. What the other components were, I have tried to indicate briefly in the preceding pages. Malaria, then, is a disease which attaches itself to particular districts, and its consequences may be classified as follows. 1. The rich, the capable, and the energetic seek healthier homes, and so the inhabitants of malarious districts tend to become a mere residue of the poor and wretched. 2. Cities being, as a rule, less malarious than cultivated plains, the urban population tends to absorb the agricultural class, the natural physique and well-being suffer in consequence. Cities isolated by malarious surroundings often fall into decay and ruin. 3. This process will be accompanied by a great economic loss, for extremely fertile districts, which are the peculiar prey of malaria, may fall altogether out of cultivation. The ruin of agriculture is a great blow to any country, and it must be remembered that malaria attacks farmers in particular, and that mostly at harvest time when all their energies are specially needed. 4. Malaria falls most heavily upon the young, whose physical powers are so weakened by repeated attacks of fever that childhood may be one long sickness, and adequate education impossible. 
estate puri si valent satis discont. The inhabitants of malarious districts age rapidly and die young. 5. Exertion and strain often bring about a relapse, because the malaria parasite will live in the body for months or even years. Naturally, the inhabitants of malarious places tend to avoid fatigue and to become sluggish and unenterprising. A habit of laziness is gradually formed. 6. Account must also be taken of the loss of life, loss of time, and the physical suffering caused by the disease. Besides the permanent psychical disturbances it may produce in the patient. Appeal made to the Greek government by the Greek Anti-Malaria League, Athens, 1907. From the severity and extent of malaria throughout all the country, one can easily perceive the moral and material losses this fearful disease inflicts upon it. In the first place, it attacks especially the age of childhood and kills a large number of children who besides being weak because of the cachetta condition of their patients, are very apt in consequence to die from the attacks. Not only of malaria itself, but also of the other diseases that accompany it, and so our otherwise excessive infant mortality is greatly increased. Moreover, even those who escape an early death and reach manhood are so imbued with the poison that they suffer from extreme debility precisely at the time when they ought to find themselves at the very height of their productive capacity. And since this disease is generally long, extending over a considerable period and attacking with repeated paroxysms, it produces chronic cachexia and undermines health from the beginning to the end of life, bringing premature old age and untimely death. As owing to the lasting influence of the malarial poison, the sufferers are incapacitated from all work. On the one hand, they are subjected to the great expenses that this disease involves, and on the other, it is with much difficulty that they provide the means to live. It ought to be considered an aggravation of the disease that country people are particularly liable to it, precisely those, in fact, from the hands of whom the kingdom expects the most valuable contributions, and who not only need bodily strength to accompany their heavy and laborious toil, but are deprived of the means of a safe and speedy recovery. Finally, it is of great significance that this disease rages just at the time when the farmer needs all his powers to gather in the fruits of the earth that are the reward of his long and continuous toil. The damage, then, inflicted by malaria is manifold. While it decreases the death rate and checks the growth of population, it also ruins the quality of the present as well as of the coming generation, lessens the resisting power of individuals and their capacity for work, and so contributes very largely to the increase of poverty and its attendant evils. Tens of millions must be the amount that is wasted yearly in the expense of nursing through the idleness of the sick, the imperfect work of the catechetic, and the uncultivated land. The Italians rightly look upon their losses as exceeding the interest on the national debt. Accordingly, throughout Greece, the prevalence of malaria is the most serious of social questions. In comparison with it, the others should be considered as a secondary importance what deserves the earnest attention of the government and council. A million acres remain uncultivated. 300,000 people fall sick every year and in consequence are compelled more or less to curtail their work, and 2,000 die. What other social question is there, the seriousness of which can be compared with the gravity of these figures? Therefore the problem of existence is, throughout Greece, the problem of malaria because it constitutes one of the most important causes of our economic misfortunes, engendering poverty, stimulating emigration, ruining the quality of the race, and so involving the greatest diminution of the national or military strength of the kingdom. No one could have pictured the damage done by this disease more graphically than the memorable Aphendoulis, who in the same medical congress of 1887 spoke as follows. Malaria is a ubiquitous foe of the Greek people, continually sapping their strength, and often, as a messenger of death, sweeping down and laying waste the land in the form of pandemic disease, involving physical exhaustion of every kind, besides loss of life. Last summer, autumn, and even winter, the disease assumed serious proportions everywhere among us, and you, sirs, who were delegates gathered together from the ends of the land, bring, each one of you, manifold deep impressions from the dreadful sickness. Malaria is a sword of Damocles hanging above our heads. It chokes the rising generation, 
drains the strength of the adults, lays waste our fields, and weakens the arms of our warriors. Numbers of soldiers have fallen victims to fevers. I wish to say besides that these same malarial fevers are crushing the nation, body and soul, and fostering among us idleness and all the evils that spring from idleness. Breathing their poisonous breath upon the face of the Greek land, they shorten by one half the life of the nation, and, like harpies, defile all that they cannot devour or snatch away. Ecclesius pros tin covenician k tin von lin peri exiglesios tis coras apo ton eliogeton. The following extracts from Macalox Malaria. 1827, are given to show how serious were the consequences of malaria before scientific treatment and prophylaxis came into vogue. Macaulay, Malaria, Chapter 9, page 428-438 to Had I been writing to the people of France or Italy, I might have omitted a large portion of this chapter, since it could only serve to remind such persons of what is far better known to them than it can be to me. But while I am unsure that such a state of things is scarcely suspected by the people of England, however much as travellers. Many of them must be interested in the facts. I have also reason to believe that it is much less known to the medical profession in our own country than it ought to be. For the authorities I might refer to a host of authors, Italian and French, but I need not here repeat names of which the most important are quoted in this book for various purposes, while the facts have been confirmed to me partially by living witnesses in whom I can place the greatest confidence, and partially by my own personal observations. They who may have travelled with an observant eye in France, Italy, Holland, Sicily, Greece or America, will have little difficulty in recognising the transcript of an original which must often have attracted their attention. It must not be understood that every one of the circumstances, physical and moral, here noticed, occur in every pernicious district since their number and intensity are proportioned to the quantity or the virulence of the malaria, and to other collateral causes which it must be now unnecessary to enumerate. But France and Italy can produce examples, as can also many other countries, where the facts are not exaggerated by the picture of them here presented. And if England is a far more moderate sufferer, it still possesses tracts, and includes people among which many of the lighter evils here enumerated will be found to exist. Further than this, I need not explain what, without some such explanation, might also be deemed a caricature, or at least a picture overcharged by the imagination, while the chapter on the geography of malaria will sufficiently indicate the places where the extremes of its pernicious effects will be found. That the residence of successive generations in a district of this nature produces a degeneracy of the races is amply shown in various parts of France and Italy, and never more distinctly than when the inhabitants of the marshy plains and valleys come into immediate contact with the people of the same radical origin and race, inhabiting the healthy mountainous or hilly tracts which bound or include these. The stature not only becomes reduced, but deformities are frequent, while anatomically the bones are found to be affected, their extremities in particular being unusually large and spongy, and rickets as a positive disease being also an implicated consequence. The colour of the skin, and the general superficial aspect of the people in these cases, has never failed to attract the attention of even the most cursory travellers. The former is sallow, or yellow, or else stained with different hues, and in extreme cases has even a livid appearance while to a medical examination it is found to pit on pressure, this condition often amounting to absolute oedema, and the muscles being soft, yielding and unelastic. Such persons have often the appearance of being fat, but this, when it exists, is wanting in firmness, as if a great part of the accumulation consisted of water in the cellular membrane. That varices and Hernia should be common in the various circumstances are facts which belong rather to the absolute diseases that prevail in the marshy districts. It is also remarked that the hair is flaccid and the beard scanty, while on the most poisonous regions of France it is further asserted that pale hair abounds when, in more healthy places, 
the very same race is noted for the darker tints. A dull, languid eye, very often also yellow, is a circumstance which has attracted general attention. An enlargement of the abdomen, commencing sometimes even from the birth, and often rendered the more conspicuous from the slenderness and emaciation of the limbs, is also a feature which no traveller has overlooked, and is often in itself sufficient to demonstrate the nature of the place where these wretched beings are doomed to live, or rather, as it happens that the Pontine marshes express it, to die. That the very form and extent of the liver can often be traced externally, by the eye, is an anatomical fact belonging to the state of things, while an investigation after death discovers various diseased structures in that organ, in the spleen, and the mesenteric glands, together with water in the cellular membrane, and a general enlargement of the whole lymphatic system. In the Pontine marshes, the residents have the appearance of walking spectres, being often also odomatous all over, and thus dragging on a miserable existence through the short term of their wretched lives. That the inhabitants of such districts have a late puberty, and are less prolific than in healthier regions, is a fact which has been asserted, and again contradicted, yet is one which could not excite surprise should it be proved. There is nothing in these pernicious countries more striking to a cursory traveller than the appearance of age which occurs at a very early period of life. Even the children are frequently wrinkled, and in France, in perhaps all the worst districts, a young woman, almost even before twenty, has the aspect of fifty, while in men, the age of forty is equivalent to sixty in healthier countries, both in appearance and vigour. The very few who live to fifty appear to have arrived at the protracted term of fourscore. Of personal beauty in females, there appears to be little traced at any time, but whatever may be existed is rarely prolonged beyond seventeen. And the expression keeps pace with all else, being that of unhappiness, stupidity and apathy, an habitual melancholy which nothing can rouse, and insensibility to almost everything which operates on the feelings of mankind in general. A slow and languid speech, a similar languor in the walk, and in all the actions indicate equally the condition of the mind and of the body in these wretched countries. That the period between thirty-five and fifty is the most hazardous and diseased portion of this diseased and miserable life is a very general remark in all the regions subject to malaria. Well, it is not less generally observed that those who survive this period often live to become old, frequently also recovering a certain portion of the health which might have been lost. Of another general effect which has been asserted to exist, it seems reasonable to entertain some doubts, since it is an assured fact that a high degree of nervous irritability, both mental and bodily, is a frequent attendant upon the chronic condition of the fevers of malaria. The assertion is that the people in question are, generally, little irritable, or even sensible, and sometimes to such a degree as scarcely to express the feelings of pain, even under surgical operations. The condition of the mental faculties, whether intellectual or moral, is scarcely less remarkable. What is more interesting, and if there should appear any exaggeration as to some particulars, or should any special fact be asserted, depend on collateral causes of another nature. The general bearing of the whole, as related of Italy and France, has been confirmed too often by remarks of a similar nature, made in America and elsewhere, by very competent observers, to leave any doubt as to the leading circumstances. The apathy which was just noticed, as expressed in the physiognomy, is a character which influences the whole conduct of these degraded and unfortunate beings, often proceeding to such a degree that they are scarcely elevated above the beasts in point of feeling. Seeking solitude, shunning society and amusements alike, without affections, without interest in anything, they make no exertions to better their condition, not even to avoid the sources of danger which surround them, or to take the most common precautions that are pointed out. While attached to the soil, to form habit or indolence rather than from regard, they will not be convinced of its nature or dangers. Fatalists in practice and even in belief, and refusing to admit that there is any other lot in life than that which is their own. That the general intellectual faculties are degraded is a universal remark, while in many places, and very notably in the Marema of Tuscany, it is observed that absolute idiotism is common. 
that such a condition is a frequent result of marsh fevers, and very particularly under improper treatment, is a fact which I must notice in the medical part of this work. But even independently of this, such stability of the intellect seems to be the produce of the insensible action of this poison on the nervous system, a circumstance that indeed might naturally be expected from physiological considerations connected with the general influence which malaria exerts on the body. And that this condition is even propagated seems further fully proved so that an universal degeneracy of mind and body both appears to be the certain lot of those races which a combination of unfortunate circumstances have placed in countries that seem to have been intended rather for the habitations of reptiles and insects than for those of man. Considering that various glandular affections are the product of malaria, it seems an object deserving of further inquiry, whether that hitherto mysterious disease also, the cretinage of the valets, may not possess some connection with the existence of this poison. Since assuredly no explanation has yet been offered respecting it, I cannot indeed find among the authors whom I have consulted any facts to confirm an opinion which is only offered as a hint for inquiry and considering that anatolous effects, as well as many other diseases unattended by absolute marsh fever, are produced by the gradual action of malaria, is at least a subject deserving the attention of those who may have an opportunity of investigating it, whether for confirmation or contradiction. It is not impossible that those writers who have attributed the disease of the valets to the peculiarity of its atmosphere, rather than to other causes so often discussed, may have taken analogous views to this, though it must still be obvious that the attachment of the goiter, at least, to mountainous or hilly regions all over the world, is a difficulty from which we cannot easily extricate ourselves. Be the explanation of this letter disease, however, what it may, it is an observation as old as psychic itself, that inferiority of the intellectual faculties is the inheritance of those who reside in marshy countries, and in a dense, foggy atmosphere. If hypocrites attributes to the effect of a salutary air the very powers of the intellect themselves, the well-known proverb respecting Boeotian abilities was not probably without a foundation, while without apparently borrowing from Greece, a similar opinion has not been less extensively entertained in our own days, and I need scarcely say applied to Holland. With respect to the moral condition of the people in those unhealthy districts, the picture drawn by Montfalcon is frightful, but as I cannot support it by sufficient evidence from other quarters, it must rest on its credibility, while it must also be questioned how far moral and political circumstances unconnected with disease or its cause may be additional agents in the production of these effects. Not to dwell on this disgusting picture, I must content myself with naming abortion, infanticide, universal libertinism, drunkenness, want of religion, gross superstitions, as the leading features, besides which, it is further said, they even proved by the police reports, while murders are common, a large proportion of the cases are those of premeditated and cautious assassination, by poison or otherwise, all the vices, says my authority, being of a mean and not of a bold character. But while adverse to quotation, I am also desirous to refer to a work from which I have been enabled to confirm many of the conclusions which had long presented themselves to myself, and whence I have recently derived a support which I had not found in the Italian writers on this subject, a statement of facts as well as opinions or conclusions which satisfies me that I have not misled myself in those which were not merely formed, but committed to paper and made ready for publication long before his book came into my hands. Coincident opinions, thus independently formed, carry with them a weight which cannot fail to strike those who have attended to the nature of evidence. Of the specific and definite diseases which are the produce of malaria, or which are endemic in marshy districts, some are now notorious to the whole world. A few appear to me to deserve or acquire the place which they have not yet received, as its frequent if not exclusive produce, and a few others must rest on the assertions or testimony of the authors by whom they have been thus enumerated. Macrolock, Malaria, page 5 to 10. But if we will not yet persuade to look about us at home, let us look abroad, 
and not even to the tropical regions, but to France and Spain and Holland and Greece and Italy, and then ask ourselves whether the subject before us is not a subject of interest. The value of life of survivorship, the average chance of approaching to the proverbial limit of three score and ten, is a measure of the salubrity of a country, and that salubrity depends mainly on the presence or absence, the range or the limitation of malaria. We may take the average of life among ourselves in round numbers at 50, with sufficient safety for this purpose. In Holland it is 25. The half of human life is cut off at one blow, and the executioner is malaria, for there is no other cause for the superior mortality of that country. But there are districts in France where it is but 22, 20, 18. So little is the chance of life, while all the instruments by which death executes his office are here superseded by one, by that one which renders all others unnecessary, which has monopolized the functions of the whole dark catalogue, malaria. Let us turn to Italy. The fairest portions of the fair land are a prey to this invisible enemy. Its fragrant breezes are poison. The dews of its summer evenings are death. The banks of its refreshing streams, its rich and flowery meadows, the borders of its glassy lakes, the luxuriant plains of its overflowing agriculture, the valley where its aromatic shrubs regale the eye and perfume the air. These are the chosen seats of this plague, the throne of malaria. Death here walks hand in hand with the sources of life, sparing none. The labour reaps his harvest but to die, or he wanders amid the luxuriance of vegetation and wealth. The ghost of man, a sufferer from his cradle to his impending grave, aged even in childhood, and laying down in misery that life which was but one disease. He is even driven from some of the richest portions of this fertile yet unhappy country, and the traveller contemplates at a distance deserts, but deserts of vegetable wealth which man dares not approach, or he dies. Nor do even his houses and towns afford him a shelter against this all-pervading pestilence. It enters with him into his chambers, and stalks through his streets. Imperial Rome herself is its chosen victim. Man flies before it, but the enemy is behind him and around him on all sides. Every day sees the dominions of death extended, and the hour is impending when the eternal city will cease to be, when it shall submit to that fate, which has been the fate of proud Nineveh and Babylon, the Queen of Nations. Such also is Sicily and Sardinia, and such is classic Greece. To live a living death, to be got off from more than half of even that life, to be placed in the midst of wealth and enjoyment, yet not to enjoy, such is the fate of man in the lands of Europe where malaria holds its chief seat, while in the tropical regions, or is to fall by thousands and tens of thousands, the summer harvest of death, walking hand in hand with that of the vegetable world. True, for this much we are free, and we may be grateful for a security purchased, as it is, by an ungenial climate and a soil less productive. But I shall soon show that our exception is far less perfect than we flatter ourselves. What we too suffer, and that we suffer, from much which we might remedy or avoid. But we can forget that we also suffer with Italy and with Greece, with Africa and the West and the East, with the entire world. As travellers, as residents, as warriors, as colonists, we partake with all. And as they suffer, so do we. Let residents, let travellers, let colonists say, if it be not so. War at least cannot forget what it suffers, what has suffered from this cause. From that malaria of which it is too often ignorant, which too often it thinks fit to despise. If the sword has slain its thousands, the malaria has slain its tens of thousands. It is disease, not the field of action which digs the grave of armies. It is malaria by which the burning spirit, fitted for better things, is quenched and in the coward's bed of death. This is the destroying angel, the pestilence which walks at noonday, and to which all other causes of mortality are but as feeble auxiliaries in the work of destruction. This is malaria, the neglected subject to which I am desirous of calling attention, that by this its powers may be diminished. Malaria, for which even ourselves, here in England, are not free, though from ignorance unaware of it, or from unwillingness to receive conviction, shuddering our eyes to the truth. 
What other causes may here act in producing the incredulity, let others say? Yet let me make one remark at least, while the explanation I will as gladly leave to others. It is a characteristic moral feature of those who reside in such unhealthy situations in France, and a fact noticed by every one who has examined those districts, to deny strenuously the existence of danger, and to maintain that neither the soil which they inhabit, nor the air in which they die rather than live, nor their modes of life or labour are not wholesome. Always ready and even ingenious in excusing the place of their nativity or residence, they invent any other cause for their diseases, rather than confess or believe in the true one, and are even indignant at those who would attempt to convince them, as if that were a reproach and a calumny. This is not the feeling of Italy, it is true, more enlightened on this subject, or at least it is a rare one, but it is a very general one in Holland, as to which country it will perhaps excite a smile in particular, to know that the people of Welcheren, repelled with no small indignation at the time of the celebrated visit of her troops, the charge of unhealthiness which was brought against their beloved birthplace. End of section 6section seven of malaria in greek history by william henry samuel jones and edward theatre withington this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recorded by leon harvey appendix one up to the present it has been the harm done by malaria that has claimed our attention but in ancient Greece, the disease may have helped to foster a new ideal of womanhood, which gradually became more prominent during the 4th and 3rd centuries BC. It is unfortunate but inevitable that the evidence is so slight. Its true value can only be appreciated when account is taken of all the other lines of testimony that have been dealt with in the preceding pages. It has been pointed out that in the new comedy, an entirely new view of marriage and of womanhood is to be found whereas the older comic poets ridiculed family life and loved all that was not purely sensual and bestowed upon hetere only. The new comedy treats of love for a virgin, the consummation of which is a happy marriage. What is more, the family relations, as illustrated by these later poets, are far more pleasant than they are in earlier poetry. According to the writer who first discussed this subject at length, the idea that a woman is a worthy object for a man's love, and that such love should find its consummation in marriage, was originally propounded by Antimachus of Colophon at the end of the 5th century, and was somehow communicated from Antimachus to Menander. Although Benek pushes his theory to extremes, he has certainly proved that in the new comedy the family relations are more cordial and affectionate but it is certainly an error to regard the question from a purely literary standpoint. Literature and the thoughts enshrined in literature must be considered in relation to the life of the people whose manners are portrayed. If Menander shows us a more exalted view of marriage, it is not because Antimachus wrote, lied, but because the Athenians had learned to love their wives more. For this change of feeling, for a change there was, even though we cannot accept altogether Benek's depreciation of wedded life in early Greece, many reasons might be brought forward by the historian. The chief of which, perhaps, is a gradual decay of the city-state. As the life of the citizen grew less absorbing and less satisfying, men put a higher value upon their families and homes, but the subtle disease, the history of which has occupied the preceding pages, seems to have played a part in bringing about the result. The most remarkable feature of the ancient medical writings is the scant attention paid to that very important factor in modern treatment, the nurse. Professional nurses were apparently unknown, and the general impression that the reader forms is that the physician did not consider the work of the attendant to be of great value. In some cases, doubtless, the household slayers acted as nurses. Thus Plutarch mentions an old serving dame, who waited on a sick man, and Diogenes Laetius makes an old woman place a charm on the neck of her patient. It is only natural that people who expected to look after their sick kindred, and so the speaker in the Aegeneticus of Isocrates takes credit to himself for nursing a friend when the relatives of the latter were themselves incapacitated. But the burden of nursing fell chiefly upon the wife. 
How wide was the scope of her duties is clear from a passage of Xenophon, which to us is all the more striking because the writer does not think he is uttering anything but mere commonplace. Whenever a slave is sick, says Ishomachus to his young wife, you must look after him. It is clear, then, that in ordinary cases it was the duty of the wife to nurse the whole household, with the help, no doubt, of her daughters or maid servants. Now, if it be true that in the 4th century there was an increase in malaria, the task of the wife must have been much heavier. In the earlier times, if the view adopted in this book be correct, the work of nursing a Greek household was comparatively light. There were children's diseases, it is true, but no measles, scalatina or smallpox. The adult members of the family lived healthy lives, untroubled by serious sickness, except occasional epidemics of plague, and probably endemic consumption. But with the increase in malaria, all this will change. Few families would escape a yearly visitation, and apart from the disease itself, the wife would have to cope with the numerous maladies that are almost always its inevitable consequences. The importance and value of the wife would increase, and she would therefore be held in high esteem and honour. It has been shown above an increased esteem, for the wife is manifest in the new comedy. Not only is this so, but a character in Menander, in pointing out the advantage of marriage, lays stress first and foremost upon the value of a wife as nurse. The speech against Nera, which was written about the same time, appeals to the journey as well aware of the value of a wife in times of sickness. Of course, what has been said does not amount to proof, but is at least strong confidentiary evidence of the view that malaria became a serious factor in the lives of the Greeks during the 4th century BC. There is but little evidence as to the manner in which the wife fulfilled this important duty of nursing her family. Evidently, she had no special training, and her only skill must have been that which came from experience. Ignorant and superstitious, the women of Greece had often recourse to charms and amulets flocked in large numbers to the dream oracle to find out the means of curing their loved ones who were sick. But in spite of this, the Greek wife must have been trained in sympathy and tact by her work as nurse. And in this way, happier relations were established between her and her husband, who possibly learnt, when prostrated year after year by a lingering disease, to appreciate those virtues which belong, in a peculiar way, to women, and especially to a mother and a wife. It will probably never be known how much the human race owes to the disease for the development of the kindlier virtues of mercy, sympathy, and tenderness. Appendix 2 Greece seems to have enjoyed a considerable immunity from the ordinary infectious diseases. Measles and smallpox are not mentioned. It is very doubtful whether the Hippocratic collection refers either to diphtheria or scarlatina. No case can be made out for the presence of syphilis or bubonic plague. In short, none of the more common infectious disorders of modern times, with certain important exceptions, are to be noticed in the Greek medical writings. In the first chapter of the book of Epidemics, there is a very clear description of mumps, with supervening ochitis, an epidemic having occurred in Thesos. The disease does not receive any particular name, and there is no reason for supposing that it was endemic throughout Greece. Typhus almost certainly occurred, especially in the early period, as famine plagues are so frequently mentioned. But as it would come in epidemics, we need not be surprised that the medical writers give no clear account of it. Their attention always taken up by endemic disease. The difficulty about typhoid has been touched upon already. The verdict of Stephanos is, as it seems to me, the right one. He says, There is nothing definite to be said about typhoid in ancient Greece although in the ancient authors are to be found certain passages and clinical observations which have been thought to point to typhoid fever. Nevertheless, the arguments brought forward up to the present are for the most part very inconclusive. At first sight, the statement of Suedo Aristotle, that fevers are not infectious, seems to settle the question. On the other hand, we do not know what the Greeks meant exactly by infection. When many people were attacked by a fever, they probably imagined that the disease was in the air, and not that it was carried from person to person. Again, typhoid may be included in loimos, which Aristotle says denoted a particularly infectious disease. If, however, the view be taken that typhoid did not exist, 
practically all the fevers in the ancient writings must be regarded as malarial, in which case the condition of Greece was much worse than it has been described in the preceding pages. Malta fever certainly existed in some parts of Greece. There can be no doubt that tuberculosis was frightfully prevalent. This is all the more remarkable inasmuch as some hold that malaria and tuberculosis are antagonistic, while the ancient Greeks certainly lived a healthy open-air life. Not only does physicists hold a prompt position in the medical writers, but it was known to be contagious. Lucian mentions the disease at least three times, and appears along with fevers as a messenger and servant of death. Tuberculosis exacts a very heavy toll from modern Greece. During the year 1905, there were 649 deaths from it in Athens alone, and for the next two years, the figures are 595 and 694. At Patras, for the same period, the deaths number 142, 117, 126, and at Seda, 125, 92, 101. These give fairly high rates, and it's been natural that Professor Savas, in his inaugural address to the Greek Anti-Malarial League, called Consumption and Malaria, the two diseases which, above all others, inflict the most damage upon the country. See Sifimenus Tis Negeus, 1st July, 1905. Diseases of the eyes were evidently extremely common. Hippocrates, in his aphorisms, says that epidemics of ophthalmia occurred in summer when the winter had been dry with winds from the north and the spring had been wet with winds from the south it was known that ophthalmia was contagious this evidence is curiously confirmed by the inscriptions to votive offerings the favorite disease in athens during the fourth century seems to have been bad eyes votive eyes in ones and twos make up two-fifths of the whole number End of section 7。section 8 of Malaria and Greek History by William Henry Samuel Jones and Edward Theodore Withington。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Conclusion In estimating the effects of malaria upon Greek history, it is important to distinguish carefully that which can be proved from that which is probable or possible. From 400 BC onwards, malaria was endemic throughout a large part of the Greek world. Therefore, whatever be the time when it was first introduced, it must have been producing its inevitable consequences at least during the 4th century and after. These consequences include the desolation of whole districts caused by the death or flight of the most energetic inhabitants, the harm inflicted upon children, the chief victims of malaria, the economic loss resulting from the decay of agriculture, and the incapacitation of labourers and others. The development of habits of inactivity or laziness due to the fear of a relapse which generally follows overexertion or chill. Hippocrates, in the treatise Airs, Waters, Places, tells us that the inhabitants of malarious districts are wretched physically and mentally. In the pseudo aristotelian Problems, we are told that they age rapidly, while Plutarch, in his treatise on health, describes how the Greeks of his day found it necessary to avoid fatigue lest an attack of fever should follow. It is also remarkable that, according to Strabo, there was no malaria in Alexandria, the city to which the Greeks crowded in the 3rd century. The above conclusions may be regarded as certain. There are only two references to malaria before 500 BC, and both are doubtful. However, it was probably to be found in some parts earlier than this. The evil reputation of the Cyberites for effeminacy may be due to exaggerated accounts of precautions taken by a wealthy people, and the coast of Asia Minor was probably infected at the time of the Ornic Revolt. Both in Magna Grecia and in Asia Minor, malaria appears, from geographical changes, to have been on the increase even in classical times. Fever was evidently common when Aristophanes wrote the Wasps, and there are signs, e.g., in the introduction of the worship of Asclepius into Athens, that ill health was increasing in Attica during the last quarter of the 5th century. Plutarch's account of the death of Pericles and the statement of Diodorus that a recrudescence of the plague was due to the action of the sun on swampy ground 
seems in a confused way to imply an epidemic of malaria in Attica at this period. This probable increase of malaria coincides in point of time with certain changes in the Greek character, which ultimately proved the ruin of the race, as the disease undoubtedly has the power to disintegrate the moral fibre of a people among whom it is endemic. It is probable that the decline of the Greeks is to be attributed, at least in part, to this cause. Pausanias states that the weakness of the Greeks in the 3rd century BC was partly due to disease, although malaria is not definitely mentioned. The history of the word melancholia shows that the Greeks appreciated the evil moral effects of this disease. Malaria, in fact, is such a serious handicap to a people that even though it does not prevent a certain degree of development, it gives free scope to other disintegrating factors. In ancient Greece, malaria was all the more deadly because the small city-states were not replenished, to any extent, by fresh blood from without. As Hippocrate says that the inhabitants of malarious regions are dark-haired, it is probable that malaria tended to eliminate the fair northern element to which the Greeks owed much of their vigour. The history of medicine after 400 BC shows a growing popularity extending even to the culture classes of the dream oracle, charms and other superstitions. This has never yet been adequately explained, but an increase of malaria and its sequelae, which cannot be successfully treated without quinine, would account for the growth of superstitious practices and for the decline of rational methods of cure. The increased respect for women, so manifest in the new comedy, may possibly be due to the part they played in nursing the sick. This generally fell upon the wife, and endemic malaria would vastly increase her duties and importance. Menander tells us how valuable as nurses were the Greek wives of his day. End of section 8「Section 9 of Malaria in Greek History » by William Henry Samuel Jones and Edward Theodore Whittington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Additional chapter. A difficulty in the history of Greek therapeutics explained by the Malaria Theory. Greek Therapeutics and the Malaria Theory in studying ancient therapeutic theories and practice, we meet with the same evolutionary processes as occur in other departments of human thought and action. The medical beliefs and methods of antiquity resemble those surviving among savages in the absence of differentiation and the dominion of animism, or a tendency to substitute arbitrary personal influences for the uniformity of natural causation. Diseases are held to be usually due to the action of demons or gods, who, if prevailed upon by prayers and offerings, are coerced by those who know the proper incantations, can also cure them. There were, of course, exceptions to this theurgic or magical treatment. Surgery was in part rational from the beginning. A dislocated joint, a broken bone, or a bleeding wound shows such obvious relation of cause and effect that their rational treatment is almost instinctive, even though here charms are looked upon as valuable aids, especially in the treatment of hemorrhage. Even the cure of internal disease is, in our earliest records, something more than a mere application of the resources of religion or sorcery. Disease and pain affect men so intimately, and often so terribly, that a sufferer will use any means to remove them. If he failed to persuade his God by prayer, or propitiate him by confession and sacrifice, he will resort to sympathetic magic, or to rites and incantations which he believes have a compelling power and vice versa. If both fail, he will have recourse to substances which have striking emetic or purgative action, or are in some fanciful association with the disease, or anything which may do good, and when some have recovered after taking these, their use will become confirmed. Most frequently, he will combine all these methods as in a modern blunderbuss prescription, and we thus get that mixture of religion magic and empiricism which makes the medical literature of the old civilizations of the Nile and Euphrates. Recent discoveries have shown that the Egyptians were remarkably skilled in the application of splints and bandages at a period more remote from the Hippocratic age than is that time from the present. 
but the most favourable specimen of our medical literature, the Papyrus Siberis, consists mainly of a number of prescriptions of very doubtful value interspersed with spells and incantations and preceded by prayers to be repeated many times during their preparation and administration. The remnants of medical writings found in the mounds of Mesopotamia are of a similar character, though the drugs seem less prominent and the charms and exorcisms of greater length and abundance and there is little sign of progress or probability of escape from this system of symbols and superstition. Indeed, the older Egyptian records are the higher scientifically, and showing a promising beginning in anatomy and surgery. So much the more amazing is the complete contrast to all this which we find in the earliest extant Greek medical writings, the Corpus Hippocraticum, the great bulk of which dates from the 5th century BC. The Hippocratic writers, while treating the medical aspect of religion with the formal respect demanded by an established cult, have nothing but contempt for charms, incantations, and all other such vulgarity. Venafsia. And what is even more remarkable, this rejection of the supernatural is not accompanied by increased faith in the power of drugs and specifics. On the contrary, these are relegated to a secondary position and used sparingly in subordination to theories over hasty and mistaken indeed, but recognising the scientific principles of uniformity and natural causation, and based upon skilled observation and definite attempts to question nature by experiment. In short, medical treatment leaps at once to a position which it failed to hold and which is not regained for twenty-two centuries. In spite of the immortality, of reputation justly bestowed upon the great Hippocrates. The full scientific value of the writings which have come down to us under his name has only lately been vindicated, and that mainly by the labours of a non-medical scholar, Professor Comperes, who in his Greek thinkers, and still more in his memorable edition of the Peritechnus, has shown that in these treatises we may find a main root of a product of the Greek intellect not merely incomparable, but no less than unique, positive or rational science. The neglect of the Hippocratic treatises, since they were considered useless professionally, and the belief long prevalent that Greek medicine arose on a basis priestcraft in the temples of Asclepius, helped to conceal this fact, and to hide, as in an Egyptian tomb, one of the most remarkable relics of ancient literature. The work Peritechnus is now known to be an oration by a non-professional author of great eloquence and ability, describing the nature and defending the efficacy of the healing art, and intended to be recited on appropriate occasions. In short, it is a unique and admirable sample of the exhibitions given by sophists, and in all probability is from the hands of the first and greatest of them, Protagoras of Abdera himself. And this remarkable work contains a no less remarkable account of the art of medicine as practiced in Greece in the 5th century BC. This art relies little upon drugs. If physicians and the healing art were dependent upon drugs only, whether purgative or astringent, for the cure of diseases, my argument would be a poor one. Nor does it profess to cure everything. On the contrary, incurable diseases are to be left alone. It makes no claim whatever to supernatural aids or inspired knowledge, and utterly ignores charms and amulets, but clearly has, and never will have, its essence in causation and the power of foretelling. In other words, relying on the uniformity of casual sequence in nature, we can, from observation of like cases, foretell the probable sequence of events and diseases, and the modifications which may be produced by changes in diet and other agencies. The knowledge how to use these agencies to best advantage as to nature quantity, time, etc., is knowledge of the art, which is thereby gained and will continue to gain the most brilliant successes. This earliest proclamation of the gospel of inductive science, strikingly modern as it is both in the positive and negative aspects, is a complete harmony with the Hippocratic writings in general. Throughout the collection there is the same subordination of drugs to dietetics and general hygiene, the same emphasis on the importance of prognosis and a knowledge of the natural history of diseases, and the same exclusion of the supernatural and priestly element both from theory and practice. This last point is of special interest, for we know that there existed in the 5th century BC, besides the ordinary 
faith cures assisted by charms and amulets, a widely spread and long-established method of cure by incubation or therapeutic dream oracles, most of them in Asclepia, or temples of Asclepius, with whose worship the Hippocratic writers, as members of the Asclepiad Guild, were at least formally connected. We might have expected that an account of the medical arts as practiced in Greece in the 5th century would have mentioned this aspect as supplementing or opposing rational treatment. But the Peritechnus contains no word on the subject. There are, says the speaker, some who ascribe cures to spontaneity or chance, and replies in the language of a modern philosopher that spontaneity as excluding cause, when properly examined, is a word without any meaning and that chance excludes purpose and deed, but does not mean uncaused. Other modes of cure are disregarded, apparently as being unworthy of notice. And the case is the same throughout. These Asclepiade, though they reverence the gods and recommend piety, never once mention the name of Asclepius after the formal notice together with Apollo and other deities in the Oath. Though the collection contains a treatise on dreams and their interpretation, there is no word about the therapeutic dream oracle. Certain diviners are admitted to be skilled in predicting from dreams things about to happen to cities and individuals, but when they try to interpret dreams for boating bodily affections, they get hopelessly muddled owing to their ignorance of physiology, and for prophylaxis can only recommend prayer, which, though fitting and very good, is not of much use by itself. Diviners, indeed, came off badly in these treatises. Ignorant physicians who quarrel with one another and give contradictory advice are said to bring scandal on the art, and almost make it resemble the art of divination, for this is how diviners act. While the god and the dream oracle are thus ignored, the third element of the temple medicine, the votive offering, is referred to twice, each time in a spirit of opposition. The passage holds up to reprobation certain cheating diviners who persuade young women recovering from hysteria to dedicate their best dresses and many other things to Artemis and hints that they had better use them to get married in. In the other, the great Hippocrates himself, in the argument leading up to his famous thesis that all diseases are equally divine and equally natural, points out that richer offerings and more imposing homage do not save the wealthier Scythians from being specially liable to a strange disease due to their peculiar habits, thus suggesting the conclusion he perhaps thought it inadvisable to formulate more clearly that the divine cannot be induced to modify its natural uniform action in disease by any sacrifices or oblations. Freedom from Superstition A dies et die monae is a quality which should adorn the physician, while the writer of the treatise on epilepsy declares that a skilful practitioner who knows how to modify, by diet, the moist, dry, hot, or cold a man, and recognises the favourable occasions, can cure even this disease, without purifications or charms, and all other such vulgarity. One form of superstition prevalent in ancient Greece has, not indeed a representation, but a striking parallel in Hippocrates, the belief in lucky and unlucky days gives half its name to the great poem of Hesoid. Observation of the natural history of diseases gave rise to the doctrine of critical days, a belief justified to a large extent, but exaggerated by the ancient physicians partially, perhaps, from an adaptation of the Pythagorean view of the mystic value of numbers, and partially by indirect influence from the popular beliefs. Sometimes a day is a stepmother, sometimes a mother, says Hesoid. Therefore, blessed is he who knows them, and he works his work unblamed of the immortals. Some days are more important for the treatment of disease than others. So might we paraphrase many Hippocratic passages. Therefore, he is the best physician who knows how to seize the opportunity, and he works his work assisted by nature. This work, the Hippocratic treatment, consisted of dietetic, pharmaceutic, and surgical divinations of which the first is one of the special glories of Hippocrates. Dietetic, he tells us, has great power for healing in all cases of disease, for preserving health in those who are well, and for bringing those who train into good condition. As regards the sick, it consists in placing them in surroundings most favourable for the action of the vis medicatrix naturae, which was supposed to express itself usually in a coctin, 
dyspepsis of the disordered humour, or humours followed by separation and evacuation of the evil. The physician must suit the diet to the habits and constitution of the patient, and especially avoid disturbance through food, which should be for the most part fluid, especially pitisani, barley water or barley gruel varying in consistency with the stage and nature of the disease. Fermentation or copious warm bathing is often of value as softening the body and favouring elimination, and even patients with acute lung disease are recommended to sleep in the open air. We find here a recognition of the importance of habit and environment, and a mixture of caution and boldness, which have been admired in all ages and most fully appreciated in our own. Drugs used by Hippocrates are for the most part evacuants, pharmacovian, meaning usually to purge, and the substances employed range in activity from hellebore and spurge to ass's milk, the drastic nature of the former exciting the respectful amazement even of medieval physicians. The last aphorism declares that knife and cordary are the final resorts of medicine, but we can only touch upon the Hippocratic surgery by mentioning the operation for empyema, which is frequently described and must have been commonly practised. It is met with the approval of eminent modern surgeons, and we can perhaps say of it with more certainty than of any other part of the Hippocratic treatment that it must frequently have obviated the tendency to death. The question as the general result of ancient therapeutics is more difficult to answer. Distinguished physicians in their own day have somewhat given vent to pessimistic utterances, probably not intended to be taken seriously as a worthlessness of medical treatment. They have, however, continued to practice and to publish successful cases. The Hippocratic writers pursue an opposite course. The great majority of their published cases end fatally, and the treatment given to those who recover is rarely considered worth mentioning. Their object, in fact, is not to record their successes, but to give natural histories of disease. Yet at the same time, their general utterances show a young, light-hearted optimism of the most refreshing character. Like their lay apologist, Protagoras, they have no doubt that the art is real and achieves the most brilliant results. The principles of medicine are already fully discovered. It remains to apply them properly, and this can be done by those whose personal capacities and external circumstances are such as enable them to acquire the knowledge. Nor would it be easy to imagine principles which could have been applied in that age with better prospects of success than the hygienic and eliminative treatment briefly outlined above. Even taking the least favourable side, some of the Hippocratic drugs have stood an empiric test of many centuries and survived both in popular and scientific use. Hyoscamus, recommended in Quartans, reappears as Hyoscamine in one of the latest professional lists of antimalarial remedies, while Cinquefoil, Botantilla reptans, which Hippocrates administered in Tertians, is still a popular remedy for Arg throughout Europe. But in its next extant recommendation, we find a significant change. Cinquefoil, according to Discorides, is a valuable remedy for Tertians and Quartans, was important to take three leaves in the former and four in the latter disease, while the addition of an amulet consisting of three crushed spiders in a bag adds greatly to the efficiency of the remedy. This brings us back to the most striking aspect of the Hippocratic medicine, its pure naturalism. It is true that naturalism was from early times characteristic of the Hellenic mind. Even the wooden gods in the Iliad are healed by means, not by miracles, and their rapid recovery is attributed to the natural perfection of their tissues. In the Odyssey, though diseases are attributed to gods or demons, and charms are used to stop bleeding, Ceres, like Medea, is a foreigner, and Odysseus is confident that not even Poseidon can give his own Polyphemus a new eye, a feat which afterwards became a favourite miracle in the Asclepia. Aeschylus classes medicine as a natural art with agriculture and navigation, but then he connects it still more closely with divination, and Pindar, though he has a poor opinion of Asclepius, has firm beliefs in charms and amulets. In short, the Corpus Hippocratium represents a high watermark of positive science even in the enlightened and rationalistic 5th century. But an ebb followed it rapidly. The epistles, which conclude the collection, though undoubtedly spurious, are of ancient, perhaps 4th century date, and show an instructive contrast to the treatises we have been considering. According to a legend, which may reflect some truth, 
the people of Abdera sent for Hippocrates to attend their famous fellow citizen Democritus for supposed insanity, and the physician is represented as writing, before he saw the patient, to reassure a mutual friend. Philopomian of Abdera. While thinking over the case, he slept, and Asclepius appeared to him not smiling and mild, as usually represented, but in obviously bad temper. Hurrying away from Abdera, followed by hissing snakes and attendants with tightly closed medicine boxes, the physician brought his divine ancestor to stay and help him. But Asclepius replied that not he but another was needed, one divine even among gods. Then he saw a lady, tall and fair, in simple garments and with eyes like stars, who took him by the hand and led him to his guest house in Abdera, though she left him, saying they would meet again at the house of Democritus. Her name, she said, was Truth, but the people of Abdera preferred another lady, who promptly appeared, also fair but bolder and more strikingly dressed, whose name was Opinion. This clearly shows, says Hippocrates, that the people of Abdera imagined Democritus to be insane, though in truth he is not so, for complete reliance can be placed on dreams of this kind, medicine and divination being closely allied, since the father of both is Apollo, also my ancestor, who foretells diseases and heals them. This is a very different view of the relation between medicine and divination from those quoted above, and reminds us of that of Aeschylus. But Aeschylus knows better. He knows that medicine and divination are gifts not of the Olympians, but of a son of the earth-born Titans, and modern mythologists confirm this. They tell us that Asclepius, the chief representative of the combination, was primitively an oracular earth spirit, whether herozoid ancestral ghost or an adjective form of the great Methonian deity in his aspect of counsellor and healer is difficult to say. Moreover, he differed from the other earth spirits and deified ancestors whose shrines were their supposed tombs or some special locality, cave, spring, or vapour vent, in the extreme ability of his worship. This seems due in part to the fact that among his earliest worshippers were the Minions, a mysterious clan of wealthy adventurers whom we find in early times all over Hellas. The most favourite seat was wealthy or Comenus, in Boeotia, but they dwelt also in Thessaly, Argonauts, and travelled westwards to Elis, where in Homer's time was the Minyan River, south of Laconia, and east to the islands of Melos and Thera, and the Ionian city Teos. In all these localities we find traces of the ancient worship of Asclepius. An allied race, perhaps a branch of the Minyans, called Phlegae, likewise dwelt in Thessaly and Boeotia, whence they colonized Phocus. They also worshipped Asclepius, and Phocus was full of Asclepia, foremost among them being that of Tithoria, where the bearded god was worshipped as Achagites, or divine founder of all Phocus, long before the youthful Apollo slew the symbolic earth serpent at Delphi and took possession of the ancient Cithonian oracle. A contest ensured, resulting in the degradation of the older deity and his conversion into a son of the younger, though he still retained his position as healer. His prominence as physician comes out clearly in Homer, though the purely human aspect there given to Asclepius has long misled mythologists. They now recognise that a poet who so humanised his own Olympian deities would have no difficulty in reducing the gods of other people still further, and that what happened to Asclepius is only one example of an important process in the development of Greek religion. The Olympian system was brought in by Achaean, or Hellenic invaders, from the north and superimposed upon an ancient Pelasian theology, whose gods and demigods were degraded into men, and scandalous stories invented about them and their mothers. But worship of many of them persisted, and that of Asclepius underwent a marvellous restoration. A tradition of his original godhead seems to have continued throughout, for Pausanias insists that Asclepius was held to be a god from the first, and had not merely acquired the reputation in course of time, but he appeals for confirmation of this to Homer, of all persons. His argument is not very convincing, but he would hardly have arrived to the belief without other evidence, and had he gone to the next world, he might have found some support even in Homer, for modern authorities tell us that the epithet, blameless, so strangely applied to such persons as Aegisthus and Salmonius, as well as to Asclepius, indicates something supernatural, and especially a degraded or non-recognised deity. 
The importance of all this for our present purpose is the evidence it affords that Asclepius was worshipped especially as a healing deity or oracle giving earth spirit for early times in many parts of Greece. Nothing is more natural than that men should sleep on the ground and seek advice and dreams from the earth spirits or divine ancestral ghosts. And we know that this incubation was practiced at the shrines of other gods or demigods, such as Trophonius and Ephorius. But it is a remarkable fact that the therapeutic dream oracle is ignored in all extant Greek literature, medical or general, till the close of the 5th century. Herodotus refers to incubation among the habits of certain African savages. The Nassimons go to the tombs of their ancestors, after praying lie down to sleep, and whatever dream they have, they make use of it. He also tells how Croesus and Mardonius consulted Amphiarius, but he gives no hint of the existence of their therapeutic dream oracle, and were it not for a lion in the wasps, Aristophanes, and a fragment of the historian Hippies of Regium, we should have no reference to medical incubation in Greece earlier than the 4th century. The most probable explanation seems to be that the custom belonged to the lower stratum of religious beliefs, that was practically confined to the vulgar, and that cultured writers, medical or lay, disdained to notice it. But towards the end of the 5th century, a striking change occurs. The worship of Asclepius was introduced into Athens, B.C. 420, and he thenceforth became more widely known and more highly honoured, finally developing into Zeus Asclepius, the saviour, cat exogen, of Greek popular religion, surviving all his fellow deities till we get a final glimpse of him about A.D. 450, when the philosopher Dominus, a Jew by faith, incubated in his temple and ate pork at his behest, a century after the establishment of Christianity. And this second period is also marked by a change of method. For the earlier times, we have only the testimony of Aristophanes and the inscriptions recently discovered at Epidarius, the 42 cures of Apollo and Asclepius, which form so amazing a contrast to the 42 clinical histories of Hippocrates. Their chief characteristics are the rapidity of their cures and the emphasis laid upon their theurgic character. When day appeared, he went away healed. It is a conclusion in nearly every case and the cure is accomplished either by the god himself or through sacred dogs or snakes. The cases indeed are either impossible miracles, such as the birth of a five years old child, or the effects of suggestion exaggerated in the telling, e.g. the instantaneous cures for blindness or paralysis, but both the early inscriptions and the early accounts indicate that the stay was short, and the cure represented as entirely supernatural. It is difficult to conceive anything more entirely opposed to rational medicine or medical teaching. In the second period, eminent persons incubate in the Asclepia. Some of them stay a considerable time, and the god now acts as consultant, giving oracles which are interpreted by the priest, the patient, or his physician. Thus Crantor, the philosopher, stayed so long in the temple of Asclepius that it was thought he would set up a school there. While Aeschines, the rhetorician was treated for three months for a wound in his head. So do the patient in Plades Curculio, seems to have had not an immediate cure, but a vice which required interpretation. This change is still more apparent in inscriptions of the Roman period, e.g. the latter ones at Epidarius, and the orations of Aelius Aristides, and here medical men carry out the instructions of the god. For there was a corresponding change in the relation between the lay and priestly medicine. We have seen that the Hippocratic writers will have nothing to do with the therapeutic dream oracle. They will not even mention it, and when they mention diviners and votive offerings in connection with disease, it is only with contempt. Nor do we find medical men in temples of Asclepius in the 4th century, but after this the title, Physician and Priest of Asclepius, begins to occur, and, what is still more significant, Medical men appear as attendants, Sekoroi, or Yepurgoi, of the god. In the Roman age, physicians even founded Asclepia and perhaps practiced in them. But this development of the temple medicine by no means caused any diminution of lay practice. On the contrary, public medical officers, of whom we have some scanty notice in the 6th and 5th centuries, now become a general institution throughout Hellas. The medical profession was, as it were established, and endowed in the 4th century, 
and in some cases were supported by a special tax, Teo Itricon, of which he gave evidence as regards Teos and Delphi. The result, however, was no endowment of research, but rather coincided with the collapse of the Hippocratic methods. The clinical histories and observations so characteristic of Hippocrates ceased for 2,000 years and were replaced by cures, magical or rational. Even Galen uses amulets, and despite his admiration for his great predecessor, tells stories of patients mainly in order to show how much better his cures were than those of other people. Nor does the scientific method of Hippocrates reappear till we come to the observations of the 16th century. In place of it, we have a return to the pre-Hippocratic system, a subordination of everything to the discovery of something which may do good, whether it be tortoise blood or crocodile tongue, remedies approved by the empiric school, or crushed spiders and green jasper stones hung round the neck, as recommended respectively by Dioscorides and Gallen. In short, there was a fresh development of that reliance on symbols and superstition, so vast a collection of which has been handed down to us in the natural history of Pliny the Elder. To sum up, we find at the end of the 5th century a rapid development and spread of the therapeutic dream oracle, now recognised by the educated and afterwards by medical men, a conversion of the Asclepia into health resorts, as well as places of supernatural medical aid, while the supernatural itself is diluted with as much medical treatment as consisted with maintenance of the essential therapeutic basis. This coincides with a cessation of scientific medical progress and a substitution of cures for clinical histories and observations. Physicians no longer look upon charms and purifications as vulgarity, phenafsia, but themselves adopt such methods. In short, therapeutics tend to revert to the ancient mixture of religion, magic, and empiricism. There were, of course, exceptions to this degeneration, and medicine, like other sciences, progressed in some departments under the fostering care of the Ptolemies at Alexandria. But that the post-Hippocratic period was marked by a loss of the scientific spirit and a failure to carry on a brilliant beginning, especially in therapeutics, seems indisputable nor is any satisfactory explanation yet being given. Such an explanation will be afforded by the increase and spread of a disease against which rational medicine was at a disadvantage as compared with religion, magic, and empiricism, and such a disease is malaria. Nowadays, the treatment of malaria represents one of the greatest triumphs of medical science. To quote an eminent authority, he who sees a physician at his work knows not whether to admire more the precision or microscopic technique which has shown the malarial parasite in the red blood corpuscles, or the skill and perseverance of those who have traced its life history in man and the mosquito, and determined the phase which it is most vulnerable to quinine. Each day the physician places a drop of the patient's blood under the microscope till he sees a parasite in that stage of development in which the drug will destroy it. No more purely scientific achievement than this can be imagined. But the ancients had neither quinine nor microscopes. They had not even bark, which our ancestors used to throw in with such vigour, and even our ancestors sometimes found that while, by throwing in bark, they had only produced extreme nausea, quacks and laymen had accomplished wonderful cures by their methods. Chief among these were rest, change of air, vehement mental emotion, strong impressions on the imagination, or even implicitly relied upon suggestion. Sir Thomas Watson tells us in his lectures that his own grandmother was famous for curing oaks, and all she did was to assure the poor people who came to be relieved that they should have no more of it after a certain day. That fear or excitement will act as a cure has long been known, probably even before Q. Fabius Maximus was healed of a courtan by one of these agencies during a battle, as recorded in Pliny's Natural History. According to Machefava and Bignami, spontaneous cure is observed not only in mild fevers, that is to say, cortan, especially the tertian, but also in fevers of the aestivo autumnal group, though not in pernicious malaria. And the main factors in spontaneous cure are rest, change, and wholesome food and drink. But these recoveries, even when frequently repeated, do not confer immunity or prevalent reinfections. 
with all their train of consequences up to a state of chronic infection and cachexia. Now, while pernicious cases would not be able to go to the temples, persons with mild forms of malaria would find there a combination of the above therapeutic agents, and many cures would doubtless take place to the encouragement of sufferers from other diseases and the greater glory of the dream oracle. These cures, however, while fostering superstition and helping to bring about the remarkable modifications in the history of therapeutics which we have attempted to describe, would not be genuine cures of malaria and would have little influence as checks upon the gradual but sure weakening of national spirit and efficiency which the disease tends to bring about. The malaria theory also helps to explain a remarkable development in the history of Greek religion. In the 6th century, there had been a partial revival of the old Pelasgic worship, but the cult of the Cathonian god of healing was kept in the background for some time longer by the prestige of the secular guild of the Asclepiidae. This derived its name from Homeric sources, took the Homeric view of Asclepius, was Olympian in worship and rationalistic in practice. But just as the fear and sense of sin produced especially by the calamities of the 6th century caused a re-emergence of Pelasgian Orphism, purifications, Dionysus, Zagreus worship, etc. So the spread of malaria seems to have brought forward once more the ancient Minyan earth spirit with his therapeutic dream oracle, which received thenceforward higher and wider recognition, till Zeus Asclepius, Xoctia ton on on, seemed at one time a possible rival of the saviour god of Christianity. End of section 9 And end of Malaria in Greek History by William Henry Samuel Jones and Edward Theodore Withington Recorded by Leon Harvey LibriVox.org